All right, let's get the party started. Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. If you're new, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button, check the bell out. That way you're notified every time I'm dropping a video and you can check out some of the critical scholars that, of course, I'm constantly bringing on the channel. You guys, uh, thank you so much for liking these videos, commenting. Even if you don't agree with us, you know, that helps <laughs> every little bit helps the uh, algorithm see the channel and continuously to grow Myth Vision Podcast. I appreciate the criticism from a lot of people on a lot of videos too, because it always makes me try to consider, you know, what if I'm wrong? What if there is something that I'm missing? And I found myself my entire life not having all the pieces, constantly trying to shift and form or formulate a better thought with criticism and see if there's better arguments that make sense. So I'm your host, Derek Lambert, and we're going to have a few people join us here shortly just to hang out on the show talking about some upcoming stuff I have, not only with them, but you guys see the thumbnail. I'm sure you're like, where are they at? Let me see the, the big dogs. Let me see the Mavericks. Let me see the, the heavy hitting scholars, Dr. Bart Ehrman, Dr. John J. Collins, Dr. Michael Shermer. I don't know if you know them by their face or if you knew them by their name. Um, I actually been reading a lot more lately than I'm used to reading. I've been lucky to be able to do that using Audible and of course reading paperback. Right now I am reading... And I'm about halfway done with the apocalyptic imagination with Dr. John J. Collins. This guy, I, I, I can't even tell you, this guy is so intense, just so well thought and, and thorough in his, in his uh, investigating from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, all the apocalyptic literature. And of course, some of these words, I literally pause reading, go on and look what they mean up on Google and say, okay, well, What's the definition of that term? Okay, so now I got to reread that sentence and try and understand what I'm reading. Uh, I, I'm really excited to tell you guys, we're going to have John J. Collins come on. Let me look at the date here. For everybody who's tuning in, he will be coming on uh, April the 2nd, which is going to be a Friday. And we're going to be talking about apocalypticism. What is it? What's going on? There's a bunch of literature that isn't in the biblical canon, so to speak, or even in the Jewish canon, you know, the, what they actually consider scripture that has this apocalyptic concept. It's a type of genre. We're going to go into that. We're going to talk about Feld prophecy, uh, ex eventu prophecy. Like the, the, he's got charts in this book. There's various forms of that with John J. Collins on the second. I'm trying to get Dr. Bart Ehrman on the 19th of May. I had a GoFundMe. Um, wonderful person popped in at the last minute. We only raised like 250 bucks. And he came and he knocked out the whole GoFundMe to make the Bart Ehrman show possible for Myth Vision Podcast. And so I'm going to do my best within the time frame to get a ton of stuff done with Bart Ehrman. I'm, I'm very excited because I've tried to get him on before. And of course, it costs to get his time to come on the show. Uh, he charges speaking ga engagements right now in order to do that. And I'm looking forward to it because I've never got to speak to the man. Right now, I'm reading Misquoting Jesus, and I just got done reading his Forged book. I suspect I need to look at counterforgery or forgery and counterforgery to really dig into his arguments in depth on why second Peter's not written by Peter. First Peter's not written by Peter. Why Ephesians wasn't written by Paul. What does that do? If those are forgeries, what does that do? It cripples fundamentalism, of course. However, even these strange groups that I've brought on the show, Israel only and such, you got a second century writing in the name of Paul talking about Gentiles. Who are these Gentiles? Well, if, you're already talking second century. Anyway, 
you get where I'm going with this. So ladies and gentlemen, not only that, I listened to this book all the way down to Florida to go see my grandma. She's actually doing really well with brain, brain cancer. She doesn't realize the implications of the brain cancer. No one's actually laid the, like told her, look, your time is limited because it had roots down into her, in her uh, brain. And they said, if they cut it, it would probably mess with her motor, motor skills and stuff like that. So just giving you an update on my granny, hopefully she's got a half a year to two years, fingers crossed. They're still evaluating the tumor that they cut out to see whether it's a level two or three. Don't know what that means exactly. Um, but while I visited my granny, I was on my way down. I had plenty of time driving. I listened to this book called The Believing Brain by Michael Shermer. If you haven't re read it, you haven't listened to it on Audible, I swear on everything you need to. Everything gets covered, like why we believe, like the mechanics behind the brain, why we're superstitious and we think things are there that may not be there. He he gets like personal accounts and stuff of people that he knew. Some voice spoke to one of his friends, giving them 13 words to tell the president. And he wouldn't tell his buddy, Michael. Michael said, look, man, are you going through something in life? I mean, and he's like, you're trying to psychoanalyze me. I heard a voice that told me these 13 words and I'm not telling anyone what they are. And he's like, look. Tell me, is there something going on in your life? He said, I'm going through a divorce. He goes, hmm, like traumatic stuff. Like, hmm, I'm wondering what these words were that this voice told you. So he finally took a guess and said, I bet you those words said something like, I love you or something to do with love. And he goes, how did you know? <laughs> well, let's just say when you've learned at the science of the mind and you understand how these things work, it made logical sense to say this voice was trying to give him some love to tell him he's loved because he's going through a marriage issue and divorcing. So it gets, it gets so good. You got to read the book. You got to listen to it. I'm going to be interviewing him as well. I had to reschedule with Lawrence Krauss. Uh, I hope he emails me back soon. I don't know how busy the guy is, but we're going to talk about a universe out of nothing. Like what are the quantum mechanics behind that? Can, can something come from nothing? What is nothing? What does that mean? How are we able to measure and like know that black space, dark matter, so to speak, has weight? So is that really nothing or is it technically something, but we call it nothing? It gets it gets pretty deep. So I rambled long enough, ladies and gentlemen. I've got uh, one of the guys hanging down in the um, in my little uh, hangout group here. He's going to come hang out and join me as well as another gentleman. And I'm going to just let you guys see who they are. So with that being said, James Valiant. Hey, Derek, how you doing? Good, bro. You How have so, the most exciting guest list coming up for us. Oh, my, my God, you have the best podcast on religion that has ever been. You really are. And, and if you've got these guys coming up, my God, how exciting is that? I mean, uh, you know, I I admire these people probably a lot more than they would admire me. But uh, to have Bar Ehrman uh, talk about, like, like you say, the pseudo epigraph and how we know it. It was written by Paul. Something is written by Paul or something. What, what is a more plausible date for it? Coming from Airman himself. Yeah. Uh, my God. And Michael Shermer. I mean, one of the most leading voices in secular, if not today, the leading voice in American secular humanism. Um, uh, wow. Wow. And to understand oh, the whole world of neurophysiology and psychology has opened up a whole perspective on under our understanding about where our emotions come from, where our beliefs come from. Now, I don't think it's it's necessary. You know, you and I have somehow managed to be critical of our own mental capacity, you know, the uh, functions so that we can be critical of our own beliefs and stuff. Exactly. I think we are capable of it. I think Michael Shermer is capable of it. But it's interesting to review neurophysiology and what the our need sometimes to believe. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> You know, I, I um, was talking to a good friend of mine yesterday. He's still a Christian. He's still technically a fundamentalist Christian. And I was just teasing him yesterday. And I was like, look, man, and uh, in the middle of the conversation, we were kind of just engaging one another back and forth. I said, watch out, bro. You got a uh, there's a invisible unicorn behind you ready to attack. <laughs> bro, he goes to Walmart by my my uh, niece, hit my brother's uh daughter she had a birthday party yesterday to go get a party like a present he sends me a picture at walmart 
with him like this. And there's a toy unicorn literally on the shelf behind him. And I was like, you <laughs> asshole, you proved me wrong. Unicorns <laughs> exist in toys. <laughs> in little girls' bedrooms, unicorns do exist, you see. <laughs> exactly. You know, I never knew about this guy, Michael Shermer. And then when I listened to his book, I was like, and, and I, I must say this as well as a host of Myth Vision and uh, engaging scholars on the mythicist side specifically, I never really took the time to engage people like, or actually even read and study people like Dr. Bart Ehrman. I've really missed out on that. But with Shermer, he did something in that book where it was like almost it, what it did for me is it made me realize that we, we can explain, like there's not a thing that we potentially can't explain with a natural explanation as to why we actually have these beliefs. And it, he even delved into in that book, the believe believing brain, like non-dualism, uh, consciousness beyond the mind, like the idea that there's just like universal consciousness out there and stuff. He delved into that. And what I appreciated about what he did or appreciate about what he did was how he didn't attack, but he said, okay, he still manned the position. Like he really did a good job almost to the point where you're like, that sounds like a, like it could be the case, you know, like, the way he still meant it sounded like he's siding with them, but then he turns around and literally ap appropriately focused on it saying, let me give you a plausible, an actual plausible explanation contrary to that one that comes from the mind that is purely natural. And that made me go, oh my gosh, uh, th this is amazing how he went into that. He even got into UFOs. He's like, what if there's another life form out there somewhere in the universe that's had five million years to evolve like we right now imagine if we didn't destroy ourselves and we evolved all right and they were able to somehow create universes uh somehow i don't know how that would be but he goes into this analogy and then he turns around and he goes yeah well you know show me and i'll believe bro <laughs> that's, that's the thing i need for me to have an idea that i consider valid i mean take any unicorn there's one. See, see, unicorn seems to me to be a plausible thing. We've got all kinds of critters on Earth. that have got two horns, one horn, a horn going this way, horns curved back this way, horns coming out that way, horns coming out their nose, you know, tusks. I mean, we got rhinoceroses and we got all kinds of stuff like that. So a uh, unicorn isn't an implausible thing at all. It's just a rearrangement of existing biological elements in our imagination. Now, if you say, I've got an invisible elf on my shoulder and he magically causes rain, now I want, wait, what, no, uh, for a concept even to be valid, ghost, unicorn, demon, I've got to be able to reduce it literally to sense perceptual data. I've got to be able to actually bring it all the way down to ver verified, mind you, not just observation, because as Shermer points out, people can have hallucinations. Drugs can affect us. The psychotics can have hallucinations. Even people without them, though, that's the thing. That's yeah. the thing. Well, just memory. Dude, if you and me don't eat for two weeks, or if I don't get sleep for seven days, oh, yeah. I'm going to meet God or an angel. <laughs> or <a demon. laughs> oh, sorry. I know my volume's probably too high. You're absolutely right. You're going to have some kind of experience. And those experiences are, what's interesting is uh, culturally variant. So if I come from, you know, an Eastern background, my view of paradise will ha will sort of have an Eastern context. If I have come from the West, I'll have a maybe a Judeo-Christian uh, context about what the afterlife is, you know, after uh, these, uh, you know, near death experiences or just memory. Memory you know, is notoriously bad as it over time. If we talk about something and you influence me in the way I remember it, I will come to remember it differently so that, you know, two years from now, some experience that we shared, my, my memory would be all screwed up about it. Dude, you're right. Okay, so first, Johnny D, thank you for that 10. I appreciate that, my friend. Keep on good work, Derek. Thank you, Johnny D. I really appreciate the super chat. I always appreciate all your guys' help, like anything and everything you guys do. Super, super thankful. So thank you so much, Johnny. And look, man, if you, if you have any questions tomorrow, I got to say this real quick. Uh, Dragons in Genesis, D Jason Folks, and Dr. Robert and Price I'm interviewing both of them together at Dr. Bob's house. So I know, man, I know, I know. Look, dude, you have the best podcast on religion ever invented. And my God, the guest list you've got coming up is just mind blowing in terms of the heavy hitter names you've got, the attention you're going to get, my brother. <laughs> the, for, yeah, the, there's no doubt about it. Uh, no, these are names, you know, like Bart Ehrman and 
Shermer that I've been following for many, many years. I'm uh, trying, man. I was going to say, um, wh what was I going to say? You said something that was interesting. And in the vein of what you were just talking about prior to me interrupting you, and I apologize for doing oh, no. that. It was really just, it was intriguing. This whole thing uh, I find fascinating. Uh, oh, belief in, in the brain and psychology. That's really fascinating. Don't trust. The point is that trauma can have an effect uh, on us that we don't even know. And it's a self-protective device. It really is. It's like our own, it's our, our psychology. Our brain has a way of healing us from trauma, protecting us from trauma. Yeah. But, you know, just like with physical illness, a scar can become a bad thing. Or it's the fever that we have when we get an infection. It's our body's immune response that could really do the damage, the fever. And the same is true with psychology. It's sort of our psychological response to trauma that can cause us to either dis dissociate, you know, memories go, you know, if they're too painful for us for the, to, to have, or we'll def develop defense mechanisms. And those can affect the way we think. We, you know, even the way we come to learn are, we develop habits about how we come to think and learn and believe so that certain things become more persuasive to us. You know, uh, oh, I remember what it was. This, okay, so you just, that, I'm glad you said that. When I got off heroin, I'm pretty transparent about all that. You are, you're a hero too. Well, but thank you. I appreciate the it. Recovery community too. You are a hero. Okay. I appreciate it, brother. When all I right. got off of heroin, um, I remember being totally desperate. I mean, like I literally was, it was a traumatic experience trying to get off heroin. It's painful huh. psychologically as well as physically. I mean, you got to face reality and I've been running from reality, numbing it for years. Right. So when I got clean, I always told the story after, you know, months after I mythologized my own experience of what I remember. And that was in my own mind. So like, and I caught myself doing this because my parents and my brothers and everyone, like back in the day, we'd have bonfires, hang out, drink beer, just chill, you know, like normal kid, boy stuff, men stuff. And everyone was like, Derek, you're the storyteller, man. Like you're the guy we love listening to your stories. You know how to tell a story. And it could be something that is based on real life, but I made it something you wanted to hear was entertaining, which meant I added some spice and flavor and seasoning. And you know what I'm saying? Like it was natural for me to do that. Why well, do it to myself? And I had psyched myself out to say synchronicities because I remember like things that seem like patterns that match the real world that I was like, hold on. This is like, that wasn't by coincidence. And I was like forcefully focused on these synchronicities and saying there was a divine thing, whatnot, that was doing that. And now I look back and I go, wow, the brain is so powerful um, to survive. It'll psych itself out. And once we, look, once we start looking for something or think something is possible, then suddenly a random series of a thousand events, the six ones that match are the only ones we're going to remember. Yeah. Not the ones that don't match. Oh, no, 990 other remember. <laughs> we're going to completely forget those. And those really didn't match. But the six that matched, the four that matched, boy, those are going to build themselves. You know, our memory works through our emotional, you know, our brain. And this is what brain scientists have figured out. We remember based on emotional saliency. So if I don't really care, if I don't, if I'm just nonplussed and I'm sitting there, oh, who cares? I'm probably not going to remember it very well. Actually, th there's a, a graph, the yerkes dotson graph, at, as stress, whether it's positive stress or negative stress, increases, so our memory increases. The ability to remember details increases until there's a panic zone, like a guy pull, pulls a gun on you in an alley and says, "Give me your lot, your money, or your life." Then we freak out and panic and our memory drops off in its quality. But as stress increases, so if I don't care, if I don't have some emotional punch to something, mm -hmm. I'm not going to remember. The more of the emotional punch, the more I remember. So I could go through a thousand events and if it doesn't conform to my preconception, I'm not going to remember those other That's nine. That's why like loved ones who, le who lose a wife or spouse literally will sometimes die from the tra trauma, from emotional trauma, but also sometimes they never let go. They live another 30 years. They'll never marry again. They just can't live with that with someone else. They, they're sticking to that memory that they have. I, I'm 100%. Real quick, I wanted to say to uh, spiritual mamzer. I think Derek should expand his horizon and focus on academic debates about other religions as well. I agree with you. Um, 
in, in light of the recent stuff that's actually been going on with my granny. And then now I'm getting back. I'm starting to send more emails out. I have so many like wants and desires and, 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 I guess you'd say I have a vision for what I'd like to do here at Myth Vision, and it would be expanding the horizon. I do want to get people like uh, on the historicity of Mu uh, Muhammad. The thing is, I've emailed Robert Spencer. He's a Christian. And of course, when I go to. You're going to get Robert Spencer on. I'm trying. I'm trying. Here's the problem, though. This is my but issue. Anyone you don't aim for. <laughs> I don't care what you believe. If, if I think what you bring is valid or you have a good point, I'm, you know, I mean, let me scratch it. No, get Robert. There's some weird God. stuff out there that I kind of don't. I purposely avoid, you know, but what I'm saying is, is if you're a Christian scholar, I've had Ian Mills on, I've had, um, Dr. Mark Goodacre. Uh, this guy is a serious scholar. He's not to be taken lightly. Leading act. They're actually real right. life scholars right. who are actually super experts in what they're doing. Uh, and, uh, whether I agree with exactly everything they say or not yeah. say about you or something, these guys are real scholars with serious right. arguments and rigorous, uh, uh, considerations behind what they say. Um, yeah. So having those guys, as again, they're always a value to have on. Uh, I'm like trying to get Robert Spencer on. I just worry because when I pitch this, I have to pitch my channel. And right. if they turn to the channel and they're Christians, they may not. And this just comes natural. And I know he's not like a liberal thinking Christian. He's more conservative. He's going to see my channel and probably go, hmm. And the odds are less likely, which I get it. So I'm looking for other scholars who aren't on the Christian uh, bias to maybe I mean, if I they mean, investigate that. Robert Spencer. So let me let me hook you up with someone I think that might uh, help you with Robert Spencer. Please knows do. It. Yeah. Matt Mason, thank you for the four ninety nine. Great stuff, guys. Um, where are we at? Oh, and then we also have uh, Arjun Van De Weird. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I hope. Thank you so much for that uh, super chat. Keep going, guys. Your gospel has even reached the end of the world, the Never Netherlands. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It is the good news, in my opinion. This is. Um, I really, really and, enjoy that, man. Thank you. Have the, the positive enthusiasm and positive attitude of a real evangelist. You've never lost that because you know what it was? It wasn't necessarily something out there. It was something in there, Derek, something in you. I okay. just love humans, man. It's That's not about it. the. It's, I just love people, bro. I mean, and some people are like, you know, you're kind of like, hey, you're just overboard. Sometimes you gotta just step away. But uh, just love people. Uh, bro. The energy and enthusiasm is what keeps us going. You know, there there are people in this world who who would uh, kill for that kind of motivation. Who have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning because yeah. of their depression. So you, as a gift. Derek, cherish it. <laughs> I'm definitely blessed to not have mental health like uh, issues, natural depression type things. I don't have all that, and I am thankful for that. But look, uh, that's that's why I got into this about the brain. We're just now learning about the brain. They're totally physical things that can induce hallucinations and just attitudinal things, depression. But you know, there's there's things we do, habits we get. We're creatures of habit. We're creatures of habit. We get into habits, and including habits of thought. And if we get used to thinking in a certain way, only certain arguments are going to feel feel satisfying to us. And we could say, "Oh well, logically, I've got all the evidence, and I've got I've thought it through sixteen times. I'm not. I've asked every expert in the field. I'm not missing anything. But something just feels wrong. That can just be the way we're brought up in terms of." You know, we discussed it before in the skepticism thing. You know, people will say, well, if there's no God, who created the universe? And I'll say, well, then who created God? Oh, no, 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 no. God can be eternal. God doesn't need a creator. He can always have been here in one sense. Well, then why couldn't the universe? You know, you know you're going to have the guy on about nothing. Right. But why couldn't, it, just in theory, why couldn't the same thing apply to the universe that would apply to God being eternal? It just doesn't feel right. And, and literally, it almost comes down to a, just a feeling that they'd rather land on a consciousness like God. You're well, right. you know how I feel about consciousness and all this metaphysical stuff. You and know, consciousness is just, you know, consciousness is secondary to existence. All the pseudo scientific garbage, as far as I'm concerned, about consciousness being what's really behind everything. Consciousness of what? Consciousness is inherent. I don't even know what consciousness means if it's not awareness of perception of knowledge of right. something else. 
You know, Michael Shermer in his book actually spends a quick brief paragraph when he gets into the whole consciousness thing. Uh, I think it's actually prior to that. He, he used the term mind. And then he said, I really don't like using that term right. mind. What do you mean? Right. Because you're right. Like there is a science and I don't know the technical term. He gets into it where you can observe yourself. Uh, the, the mind is a, is a very good functioning machine, if you will. Um, mind. Well, mind. It is well, people separate, separate mind from brain, or they'll say, you know, there's two you's, kind of like a dualistic person. And he, he handles that. He goes into that and shows why right. we think that way and stuff. Right. Consciousness is sort of what my brain is doing. Consciousness is a process and activity. It's, it's not a physical thing. And to treat consciousness like a physical thing or to, to treat, to, to suggest it has to be, will of course create a, will quote, insolvable problem of conscious, a hard problem of consciousness for you out there. Because you, you, you know what it is. You're trained to think that it's an immortal soul that can, isn't necessarily connected to a body at all. We're just really spirits shoved into a machine. We're sort of like ghosts in a robot. And uh, that robot can die and our soul goes on for, and then, 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 then. Nonsense. I am an integrated being. My consciousness, my awareness is actually what my brain is doing. Is what my brain is doing. It's not a thing that you can weigh consciousness. It's a process. It's an ongoing activity. My little toe is an organ of sense. I'm an integrated being of mind and body. I'm one thing. I'm a mind body, a body mind. To try and separate my consciousness out from my body is to eliminate its actual cause. A co something as, as amazing as our consciousness cannot exist without a cause. Our consciousness has a nature. It can be affected by drugs. It has to work in a certain way. Oh, cut your head off and you're dead and consciousness ends altogether. It's, it's, not, it's almost unfalsifiable <laughs> in a way for some people because they'll like, uh, let's say I do a lobotomy on you. I take a part of your frontal lobe cortex and I did Ding your, you know, I messed up your motor skills a little. Um, when that chunk of your brain gets taken, all right, that part of the consciousness that they like to argue, well, that, that it just minimalized the uh, the motor skill of your consciousness because your consciousness can't work without the brain. That's the vehicle in which it works. And I'm thinking to myself, what's more likely? Like, you know, that your brain itself is this thing that's doing it, or there's some other thing that in the brain is what's doing it. And to me, it seems more likely oh, the first you can part. See consciousness in other creatures, all the way down to insects react. When I swat a fly, it flies away and tries to, okay. A fly has a kind of reactive mechanism like my consciousness, a fly. But then I see it in other animals. I see complex social behavior in mammals, Consciousness is going on in other critters than human beings. Different kind of consciousness. You know, in fact, we can measure different ways in which animals perceive. Eagles have the most astonishing eyesight. They can focus in from literally a mile up in the sky. They can focus in on a little rabbit moving on the ground below it, with clarity that was we cannot. Dogs, their smell and their hearing far exceeds ours. Far exceeds ours. They, their, their awareness is just a different thing. They must have a different internal experience, but you can see them react like we do. Look, Derek, take a thing like memory. We were at a party last week and we were talking to Bart Ehrman, let's say. Let's make up a fantasy party. We're oh, talking to Bart Ehrman. And I'm talking to you this week. How do I know that you possess the faculty of memory? I look back and I remember the party and I say, oh, yeah, what a cool party it was. Bart Ehrman was there and Derek was there and we talked. And I ask you, how do I know you? I have a consciousness like me and memory. Well, you remember the details like I do. Oh, yeah. You remember when Bart was there and we talked to him? Oh, what a great time. Yes. So I can infer because I don't have access to your mind like I do my own. In fact, we only have access to our own minds. But I can infer that you have a faculty like memory, just like I do. I look inside and I say, oh, yeah, I remember that. And Oh, Derek, he remembers that. So consciousness is something that we are conscious of. But the fact of consciousness, you can't get under. Because how are we aware of how brains work? With our consciousness. If you have some doubt about what consciousness is, it goes all the way down to the very root. You can't, in other words, Descartes was right about something. There's a, when you get right down to it, consciousness is an axiom. 
Now, I would say he was wrong about having to the need to infer existence and consciousness being the axiom. I think you got to have both. I think both are axioms. And in fact, he got the order wrong. Existence has primacy over consciousness. Just logically, uh, he says cogito. You start with physical. Uh, assume yeah. has to come before the cogito. He got a B before he can think because thinking is the relational thing, right? You are the one aware of whatever it is. But I infer that you're aware and conscious just like I am. It's an inference, even though I am axiomatically aware of my own consciousness. It is an irreducible floor of any awareness. In fact, everything you believe, everything you know, implies this is something of which I'm aware. This is something of which I'm aware. Existence and consciousness are irreducible axioms. And by axiom, I mean they lay at the root of all knowledge, and all other knowledge assumes them. If you were to doubt that you were conscious, you'd be contradicting yourself. You'd be conscious of what, wait, wait a minute, I have to be conscious to be doubting. If you were to doubt existence, you would doubt the nature of consciousness. You can't do that. Interesting. Yeah, I just... Uh couple of people have been commenting one of them said they had an outer body experience twice that gets covered in the um that gets covered in michael Shermer's book the believing brain about these near-death experiences outer body experiences why people see themselves for example in these kind of experiences and stuff there's some want, interesting stuff you really if you, you don't want to take this into a dark path but i have known in my life people who have had those kind of experiences when they were fully conscious and in most cases, they were people in undergoing horrible trauma at the time. There are people who are, while they're being tortured or raped, will leave, just, I gotta leave, get out of my head. It is, again, it's a, it's a brain psychological defense mechanism to dissociate yourself from the horrible thing that's happening, the fear and the trauma that you're going through. Um, so, yeah. I saw a video of a, uh, they were doing this uh, with, um, uh, testing these pilots that were flying jets, fighter jets. So they're like going through the process of training and yeah. they were filming them doing, um, going into uh, Mach one, Mach two, like hardcore gravity type stuff. Speeds, yeah. And in this, like I've seen quite a few of those videos. My father's a retired green beret in the special forces. And I just like watched some of that stuff. And this guy, because what happens is the, the blood stops, the oxygen's not getting to the brain because the gravity's so intense, and they're trying to train to get through it. <laughs> and this guy ends up passing out, and he literally does something like this. This is horrible. I'm gonna try and reenact. He's like, and like, like I can't even. He's like fighting, and then he comes back, and the guy, and the guy who's filming goes, "You okay?" And he's like, "Dude, did I just get in a fight?" Like he thought he fought someone like he, he, and he said it felt like 30 minutes, like, but it was like 10 seconds just cut off. And he had this like fight with someone and then he was back. So right. you can observe so, this. He yeah. does the weirdest stuff, especially when you put it under physical or emotional stress. And sometimes we don't even know where those stresses are coming from. Yeah, Jim And Boy. too, if we're conditioned, you know, by our culture, by our religion to interpret these things in a certain way. We'll say my soul left my body. My soul was, you know, going up to the next dimension or the afterlife or something. Well, you're interpreting what you're doing is your conceptual interpretation comes from your culture and the way you were taught. Where, but your brain just simply had a weird kind of misfire that can has, may have some perfectly mm. natural explanation. Mm. Even in the realm of science, you can't just say I saw something and therefore explain it and include it in your theories no 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 an observation has to be verified because people's brains do misfire mm -hmm. sometimes you know that hallucination that you, that you can have or the mistake you have or the distortion of your memory over time that can you so easily have or i could be sitting in a hot boy i've had this experience sitting in a hospital bed and they've got an iv of you know, just serious drugs dial out like the heroin you were on. They're yeah. giving it to me straight in my arm, pharmaceutical quality. Of course, my head is going to go weird places. And it's in those moments that I tell myself, I can't really trust <laughs> what I'm seeing or what I'm hearing or even what I'm feeling uh, because there's these, something's screwing with my brain. 
My brain is necessary for my consciousness. Consciousness can't just free float out there, much less, in my view, be the metaphysical source of reality like some of these. So let the, the me, I'm going to shift this because really what we've been doing in this is talking kind of in the vein of each topic of the scholar that I'm bringing on. Uh, we just got, we've been talking mainly Michael Shermer stuff. The, yeah, the that's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, and you're, you're really good at explaining and going in depth. Oh, um, no, Bart Ehrman's cool because early Christian forgeries are just an interesting subject. Yes. And early Christians messed with their own documents and credited things to Paul that couldn't be credited to Paul and stuff like that. Well, yeah. I was just about to get into the vein of Christianity for a second here, too, from yeah. my background. My buddy that I joked around and said, hey, dude, you've got an invisible unicorn behind you right now. And he goes, oh, you're funny. And I'm like. I mean, honestly, how do you know there's not? Or I, you know, I said, how do you know when you die, you're not going to meet Ahura Mazda? And he said, why did you follow Jesus? Most of the world are, in terms of religious, you know, mostly Christian. Uh, you guys followed the, the wide and broad path uh, by becoming Christian. Why didn't you find the, the narrow and wise path, Ahura Mazda? And now I'm going to have to cook you in hell forever, which I joked with him, right? So well, I, well, I ended up. It has sort of gained, let, it's less popular than it was. Say, yeah, ago. yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the more obscure religions now. Right, right. I, I said to him, I said, look, uh, you know, why do you trust this book? I used, um, there's a guy, I don't know if you're aware of the gentleman named Pine Creek. Uh, he has a YouTube channel. I love his stuff. He's just big into epistemology, but he likes to take the Christianity stuff, combine it into epistemology and test people. Well, he has this flying man analogy. And um, hold on real quick. Margaret Barker, I emailed her, Christopher Malloy, and thank you for the super chat, my friend. I am definitely trying to get her on, even if I have to donate for her time to get her on, because she's so good on first, second temple type Judaism, and I, just very deep in her information. And also, I forgot to say thank you to Dragons and Genesis for his super chat earlier. Uh, tomorrow, I'm meeting him in person, of course, and recording, so it's going to be really good. Um Back on topic real quick. I just want to finish this because I want your thoughts on this. I think it's interesting. When I was a Christian, I listened to debates from William Lane Craig against guys like Richard Dawkins. And I just the whole time I was like, get him, William. Like, screw this guy, Dawkins. Like, I literally inside, even though I didn't outwardly do that, sometimes I would even skip the skeptics presentation just to hear the Christian response. Like that's how I was as a Christian. I, I'm not going to lie. It was just cognitive dissonance. And I wanted my pet beliefs to be true. So I asked my friend yesterday, like if I wrote this down and said, this guy says he ran off a cliff and flew across the world, didn't have a spacecraft, no hidden trick, literally could fly across the world. Would you believe that's fiction or nonfiction? Right. I did the same uh, Pine Creek thing. He said, well, based on that, I would say that's probably fiction. And I'm like, okay, well, 500 people saw him. It says it in the same book. 500 people saw him. He had 12 followers. Is it fiction or not fiction? Well, he goes, I'd need more evidence than just the book. And I said, good. Now he said, <laughs> but he said, he said, I'm going to stop you there, Derek. This is what he said. There are 300 or so accounts outside of the Bible. Now listen to how fabricated this is. I don't know where he created this in his mind to protect his belief. There are 300 accounts outside of the new Testament that attest that, G that Jesus rose from the dead, that, that there were eyewitnesses that, that it's real. And I just said to myself, 300, I said, bro, you're going to have to send me this evidence because I've never like the only place that actually attests that it actually like claims that there were witnesses like Paul writing in first Corinthians 15. If that's not interpolated as Dr. Right. Price said, exactly. Even the Corinthians thing could just be a formula. And there's, a, there's a huge yes. debate over yes. even what that is. Uh, right. You know, he appeared to James and the Twelve and Kephas and lastly to me. And Let's that. just say that happened. Let's right. just say that happened. We, right. He's acting like there's something outside. And I thought to myself, James, and maybe you can comment, because this ties into the whole Shermer thing and Ehrman. Like, what the heck? I mean, do you think he's just trying to do anything to keep his belief right? Because if I could show him yeah. evidence contrary, I think he's still going to go to the inner experience. I felt. I well, know. My experience told me. See, I see, critical scholars, you and I know, the critical scholars have looked at this very carefully. They know that even our earliest fragmentary bits of New Testament text only go back, the earliest little bits go back to the second century at best. Mm -hmm. And uh, more than that, critical scholars know that really 
like Mark 13 has to be written after the Jewish war, for example. And so we know something about these sources and we know what those sources are and critical scholars have given it a hard look. And so if there were these sources that this guy's talking about, it would be a big news headline to Bible scholars. You mean there were hundreds of contemporaries who actually Wow, <laughs> because that's news to us. As far as we're concerned, it starts with, you know, a few of the letters credited to Paul and maybe just bits within those to yeah. go back to the original. And then the literature built and grew from there. And scholars can sort of, you know, figure things out that way. Uh, and so if you're not looking at the evidence, the actual evidence, like I say, reducing it to the verified observations like yeah. the texts we know about, and the evidence we know about. And you're, you see, the source of uh, cognitive distortion is our emotions. It really is. When we want to believe something, when something feels good to believe, we are going to move heaven and earth to protect that belief. The belief itself is an important part of our psychologies. Yeah. Uh, and when that happens, we're in the danger zone. Well, that it, it got worse from there, James. It got it got worse because once he saw what I was doing, and I was doing it really gentle. I mean, that's what Pine Creek will tell you. You know, look, take them through the flying man, but you want to be kind and just like let them play in the sandbox with you. I think it's fiction. Do you think it's fiction? I I wouldn't have any reason to believe a, a guy flew across the world without wings, without an aircraft, just because he said he had the power to. Back, I don't know. Right. And, and and that there were 500 witnesses. It says it right here. It says it right here. Um, and yeah, so so we went from there. And then I was like, look, he started getting real defensive, which is natural. Right. And then I said, dude, you got a you got an invisible unicorn right behind you, bro. Right, right. there, right there. And Literally. he's like, and he's like, no, stop. And I'm like, seriously, how can you tell me there isn't an invisible unicorn there? Because he kept talking about this whole, you know when you die, you're probably going to go somewhere. And I, dude, I totally get where he's coming from and why he's doing it. But, um, he was thankful to have the conversation. We talked for like an hour and, uh, he left and he, you know what he said to me? And this is, I'm not sure this isn't funny, but it's just something that I've heard twice in the last three days. Derek, you were once here, you went, and now you're here. You're on the other side of the circle. You're going to come first full circle one day and you're going to come back to the Lord. This is what he said. And another Christian said this to me as well. Um, and now his he's writing me on Facebook Messenger last night. He doesn't sound so friendly now. He sounds more like uh, he's ready to attack what I'm saying on Myth Vision and, and um, shoot down these stupid scholars that you have. They're not even real scholars. I said, please give me a list of the real scholars that you're talking you know, about. Would you prefer I try and get right? Like who is this real <laughs> scholar that you're talking about? And he's a Calvinist. So I'm wondering if he means like, uh, right. you know, one of the Calvinist apologists that are out there. Like who, who, who's the real scholar that you, you yeah, know, you're saying the real deal here. Yeah, truly. Uh, <laughs> you know, you have, and you aim to have the, biggest best names in the business if people have throw have ideas out there you are you, the thing is you're open to everything you're open to a guy in australia who says he's jesus <laughs> you know, you're right. open to and i want to thank you i think that roman provenance is a serious theory that will one day take over the field but you know back when you were starting you reached out to me and our relationship developed because you had a mind willing to go anywhere that the evidence would take it. And if someone had a good argument, or at least could make a, an articulate, logical argument, you'd give them a chance. It's not as though your mind is closed. You're willing to listen to anyone who has a coherent case to make. I got to say on the AJ Jesus thing, though, I didn't believe this guy was who he was. Okay. I, right. I, and I even told him prior to the interview, I was like, look, uh, I don't believe jesus period and i don't believe that you are him but, you're jesus. <laughs> yeah, but i would like to to interview you just to hear what you say like allow right. you a platform to say what you think then things went real south after i recorded that show i mean it got real real sour fast he responded like man i can't even describe how high and mighty his words were back to me like me and my buddy david need to 
pretty much worshiped the ground. He was walking. And I started to really, at that point, then I said, dude, this guy might really be Jesus now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but I mean, yeah, wow. he was yeah. an asshole. He was an asshole. And then his, he had his wife email us and I had to say something. I was like, look, it, it, I'm not fond of bullies. And so I right. wrote her back. I says, look, Mary, I hate to break it to you. You're not the first Mary that he's claimed was Mary. You know, I had to lay the news down. Ooh, that, that's it's true. Hurt. Well, that's because I'm doing research now. There was another Magdalene before me? There was at least two. At least two that I know of. Yeah. It must be heartbreaking for her. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but yes, you're right. I try to give people opportunities and I want to get the, like, I want to see consensus. I'm not just going to run with being hypercritical and I don't mean hyper derogatory. I mean, like some people say, for example, Dr. Price might be going too far on things. His uh, is Paul Simon Magus. I'm not convinced. I tell him that uh, I, I do think there's potential parallels here. I do put, I do think there may be layers there. It's, it's possible that Simon Magus tradition overlapped an earlier Pauline uh, corpus. I, I'm not closed off to his theory either, but I'm just not like, this is the fact. And this is like, you know, and Dr. Bob and me are like best friends. So I tell Dr. Bob, I'm like, I, I don't know, you know, here we're talking fragmentary evidence. We're talking. I mean, think of it. If we don't explore, you know, Aristotle said something really, really smart, really wise. The mark of an intelligent person is their ability to entertain an idea without believing it. Hmm. Let's consider it. Let's go down that path. What if, and what if, and what if? And what's great about Dr. Bob is that he's willing to entertain, again, it, 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 the guy from Australia, he's probably gonna dismiss, but if someone's got a good case, if someone has an evidence-based argument, he will at least explore the hypothesis to see if it is a valid one based on the evidence. He'll go further. If it seems like a valid hypothesis, he'll test the limits of that. Could it be consistent with the evidence? In his mind, the way Simon Magus is described is just too too much of an echo, his criticism yeah. of the law, his arguments with, you know. And so uh, since they needed the Paul figure, it's easy to believe that they would whitewash all the good stuff and give us Paul and sort of create an alter ego to carry all the bad stuff at the time, Simon Magus. In, in one way, that makes sense, but you're right. It's a hypothesis. Do I know for sure? Do I exactly know, for example, where the pseudo-Clementine literature gets its ideas about Paul and Peter? Do I exactly know where the where some of the Apocrypha get their ideas about, you know, Jesus kissing Mary Magdalene, for example? Or, you know, and you could develop a whole conspiracy theory about it and say, okay, Jesus must have been married and Jesus had kids. And you could do a Dan Brown thing and tell me that there are descendants of jesus today who were descendants of french kings I i'm one know. of them i'm one of them i'm i know for a fact i'm just kidding <laughs> no but you're you're 100 right i mean it's really good to entertain these theories without putting too much concrete in the bag because dude i've been i've been like solidified in my positions in the past and been dead wrong so <laughs> And, you know, I've learned over the years that it is best to say, I don't know when we don't know, when I don't know. Right. And I really wish historians and scientists would be more um, easy about saying that. You know, we'll read headlines like science in the field has been overturned. That, that's not the case usually. You know, we'll hear, for example, how we'll take the evolution of humans from earlier hominids they'll find some new way in which humans descend from some hominid species. So correct the family tree, if you will, of evolution. They'll say the field has been overturned. What? Wait, the, the, the way you put your family tree together was always just a theory and a hypothesis. The general idea that we evolved from Australopithecines and earlier hominids, that's true. Why don't you just stop there? We know that <laughs> this particular formulation of the family tree is subject to change as the evidence is fragmentary and we're still learning. That's true. And, and so if people could do that, and like I say, in the field of ancient history, you'd think that would be the first thing they'd say. Look, this is, a, this is ancient stuff. We're basically, someone described archaeology as uh, the attempt to learn about history uh, pol say the political history of England by going through a couple of waste paper baskets at the Houses of Parliament. Mm. Archaeology is like trying to figure out the history of a place like Parliament from what we find in a waste paper basket. That is a brilliant analogy. And we have to bear in mind that the, the 
texts that we have, only we only have them because they came through Christian hands, Muslim hands, back into Christian hands. <laughs> the wow. people who were even transmitting this to us were not copying certain things, copying other things, bleaching. Now get this. A thousand years ago in Byzantium, they'd have a copy of Archimedes' scientific method. They'd have some copy of some work by Aristotle. And they'd bleach it out, turn the, the vellum, you know, that, that's, that it's printed on, turn it around, cut it up, make it into some kind of Christian hymn or prayer book. And today we learn that some of those lost works from the ancient times are were just completely lost to us, lost to us until we found that, you know, if we turn around this thousand-year-old Christian prayer book, undo the pages, put in an x-ray machine, we can see there was an earlier text from some Greek scientist or philosopher underneath. We're mm. still learning. We're still learning all that we have forgotten from the ancient world. 100%. No, 100%. You're, you're right on the money. And this is something that leads into what I've been reading lately. I just finished the book last night. Let me get the title for it. John J. Collins. We hit Michael Shermer. We touched on Bart Ehrman. These are upcoming guys for the 216 or so people that are watching live. We are going to be interviewing all three of the faces you saw on the thumbnail and they're coming. John J. Collins, heavy hitting scholar, Dr. Bart Ehrman. You guys know his name, especially if you're watching this channel, because we always delve into the Jesus stuff. And then of course, Dr. Michael Shermer on the believing brain, his book, the believing brain. But the book that I finished last night, James is, um, and this is by the only audible book that John J. Collins has, The Dead Sea Scrolls, a biography, John J. Collins. And holy moly, bro, like it, amazing. I never knew this about like the various thoughts and theories about these scripts. Like were they in a scene community? And he's like, hold on, hold your horses before you jump into that. There are some fragments in there that aren't very um, – uh, sectarian that are found in the Qumran. Uh, he goes into all this stuff, like how this apocalyptic type of uh, movement of literature pre-existed the Christian literature. And where did like the book of revelation get its ideas from? So he started digging into that and the book I'm reading now, which is like his book on the topic, the apocalyptic imagination, I'm about halfway through it. You know, I'm taking my time. I have to sometimes reread the paragraph. It's that yep. deep. Um, right now I'm in the Dead Sea Scrolls section, but I want to delve into this thing. I want to talk about apocalyptic stuff. I want to talk about the end of the world. Was that really what preterists say it is? Guys, I know I insert that because it really is so little compared to the grand scheme of like Christianity and how they view the end is still coming in the future. Uh, Donald J. Trump is the sign of the beast. That's well, it's like, let's, yeah. let's go, go back, say to the second century BC and whoever the dude is that's finalizing Daniel, in his mind, in his mind, what are these crazy beasts? You know, what are the, what is this vision of these? Uh, what is the son of man who comes mm -hmm. through and da 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 da, the son of man? <laughs> it's not literally beasts and it's not literally a man. This is obviously an allegory. It's an allegory. So you, you, we, if we ask ourselves, what did Daniel's community really believe about? The future or end times, you know, well, there, Daniel appears to have a resurrection of the dead at the end. That's yeah. a unusual idea in Hebrew thought, right there. John J. Collins actually says in his commentary, and he's been saying in his writings that the Son of Man, if I'm not mistaken, or what? Yeah, the Son of Man, I believe, is actually Michael the Archangel. His his argument, I think, I, I might have this confused. Someone in the comment section, if you're aware of John J. Collins. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's what he comes to the conclusion, which is why when I interviewed him the first time, I've had an interview with him previously, I tried to slip in the whole angelic Jesus concept from mythicism because I was like, okay, well, if the son of man in Daniel potentially is the angel Michael, uh, the archangel Michael, who's fighting on behalf of Israel, God's chosen people, you have Gabriel in there as well, but Michael shows up. And of course, he's fighting the prince of Persia, all right, which is obviously not the literal prince in Persia. Uh, he is some angel or some heavenly figure that is representative of that nation. And so, yeah, I asked about it in the New Testament. And I was like, well, could Jesus have been an angelic? You know, I tried to get there. I don't think he followed that logic and said, yeah, that's the case. But uh, 
we'll see what happens in this next interview as we get into apocalypticism. I don't know where that's going to take us. It just take though a second of of a literalism on the part of a simple-minded person hearing Daniel to believe something more literal about what Daniel is saying. It could be the archangel, who knows? Or it could be, as many scholars believe, just and just like the other beasts, a symbolic image for the people of Israel themselves. The son of man is whatever the messianic triumph will be. Hmm. Spoken of in allegorical terms, that's what some people think Daniel is. Just that simple. It's an allegory for the triumph of Israel. There's no concrete being actually there any more than there was the concrete being. Right. But they were still superstitious. And I so think rationalists, rationalists mind reading that's that. the problem, I think, though, personally for rationalists is when they run to these texts and they want to uh, decode everything. Oh, Sons of God was actually a line of Seth and therefore it wasn't angelic. Oh, they didn't really believe in angels that flew in the sky. Uh, that meant a representative of only a priest. I'm personally... No, I think they were superstitious. I'm more in line with the idea that the sons of God in Genesis 6, for example, if you look at the Mesopotamian literature this comes from, how did they view it? And was it just right. purely humans on the ground? Mm. Uh, I don't think so. I think they were superstitious. That's yeah. my, I mean, I also well, like, I it's like trying to believe that a chariot came down and got Elijah. Right. Come on. We're meant to believe that when they tell us that. We're meant to believe that Jonah was in the belly of a large fish for three days. We're meant to believe that. Now, again, were the original authors of these things thinking in allegorical terms? Maybe. And it may be that sort of in a childlike way, later generations just accepted it as a literal story. Yeah. God so loved Elijah and Elijah done such a good job for God. He sent down a chariot and plucked him up and brought him to heaven. And, you know, Jonah, boy, Jonah, he really wanted Jonah to go talk to the those people in Nineveh. So he had the giant whale, he sent the storm, had Jonah, you know, thrown overboard and the giant whale was in there for three days. Yep, yep, literally, that's what literally happened. And Samson, you know, once his, you know, he, that hair, once that Delilah cut his hair off, yeah. suddenly the strongest man in the world lost all his strength. Mm. And the Philistines could capture and blind him because, you know, he, that's just the way it went down, Derek. And yeah, I, I have a hard time <laughs> believing. I don't, you know, what's hard for me to, to wrap my head around is did the author writing this believe what he was writing, literally? Whereas we know, for example, we look at Genesis, we see a lot of allegorical, what appears to be allegorical stuff. It sounds like, yeah, did that really happen? But it looks like New Testament people in in the writers believed that was literal so it's like the point what, what's going on here you know and paul will talk about it you know he'll twist Tor torah left and right he'll twist hebrew scripture left and right poor hosea gets turned on his head as far as i'm concerned with all due respect to our israel only friends but for all of paul's pressurizing distorting of hebrew literature he seems to take it seriously just as when abraham and just as when moses his audience apparently literally believes these stories from genesis yes mm -hmm. just as it happened with in the days of abraham and just as it happened in the days of moses he's talking to a bunch of people who literally think those things literally happened mm. yeah that's you what know, it seems like you didn't think that enoch was taken up why would something like the visions of enoch be a be a thing to you. Ah, oh, what did Enoch see when he got there? Mm -hmm. And when he got up there and God showed him around, what sorts of things might Enoch have seen? And so it, you know, think of the, think of, I mean, these guys may have been taking drugs or may have had some organic brain problem. Yeah. I don't know. But if you're having like <laughs> visions of what the hell did Enoch really see over there, you know, these people may have been tripping balls okay to see to have this vision of enoch or whatever but you know they read in genesis that god loved enoch and he walked with god and so enoch just was taken up so what the heck did he if you were enoch what would you have seen dude when i used to read this stuff i'd be like how come that can't be me you know like <laughs> why can't you just take me up this isn't you know i always thought that I, I could have seen the burning bush on you know the the foot foothills of mount sinai if yeah. god could just talk to me once yeah. what did say a cough <laughs> <laughs> dude I, in that book uh well this one too but mainly in in that uh audio that i was listening to yesterday with the dead sea scrolls and john j collins he goes into the enochian literature of course and he said look what scholars are thinking about right now is that mostly what you see is mosaic uh judaism but there was enochic judaism 
and this this apocalyptic Enoch Judaism, when they go through the book of Enoch, there's it, and by the way, one Enoch isn't really one book. It's like a compilation of material that is from different times that has different genre and whatnot. And he goes into that breaking it down. And God, it's way over my head, guys. That's well, John Day Collins. From a more early Jewish context, some of it a later a Christian overlay, yeah. which sort of conditions all of it. Uh, yeah, no, it's fat. That's just a fascinating study right there. It just makes it? me think like, what was Enoch do? Why is it Enoch Judaism or Enochian Judaism, not Mosaic? And John J. Collins brought up the point that they're trying to pull to a person prior to the Mosaic covenant um, and kind of giving it more of a universal implication saying all mankind, whereas Mosaic, you can argue strictly 12 tribish. Uh, it's, it's, you know, only this. And the Enochian is more broad and scoped prior to the 12 tribe concept. So he, it, 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 once you get to Noah and Enoch and Adam, you're talking about the ancestors of all mankind. Right. According, according to their mythology. Right. Right. If you're talking Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, obviously these are the patriarchs of, you know, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people. Right. But if, this is what's really interesting. When they do reach out to Noah or Adam, there does appear often an Enoch. There does appear to be an appeal to a, a bro the broader humanity. That they're the ancestors of all of us, according to Genesis, right. not just the Hebrews. Absolutely, and I just cannot wait, man. I'm excited, and I'm writing other people. So, like uh, Ian Mills, he's an upcoming PhD student at Duke University, which is like hour and fifteen minutes. He's going to rent. Let me see if I can get a picture of this. This is pretty cool. He's trying to rent out the uh, library up there. So that uh, I can go up there and interview him. Let me see if you can see it. All right. This is, uh, let me do it like this. Okay. See if you can see that. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's kind of blurry because the light, but uh, it's going to be a nice big area. And I'm going to be interviewing him on various topics. Uh, Dr. Joshua Bowen, of course, with his book on slavery. I want to talk more about slavery in the Bible. And I was saying this yesterday to my buddy, like God knows the future, dude. Like, our morality seems to be better than God's. Like he could have condemned it. He could have completely just obliterated said, look, uh, don't practice this at all. At all. We at all. That. At all. Now I know you know, you'll focus on that. Well, Jewish slaves have to be liberated during Jubilee and so forth. And it's only poor and slave. They'll go through a whole list of, again, apologetic rationalizations about it. And God, we weren't ready for it at that stage in human evolution to know, no, it was important that we not combine dairy products and meat. It was important that we not eat shellfish, but somehow getting, getting slavery completely done away with was somehow. Yeah. But that shellfish though. But that shellfish though, that Derek. Shellfish. I very much and much. don't wear more than one. You put two cloths together. We got a problem here. Well, so, we got a problem. Yeah, you better wash it. Better wash it. <laughs> uh, Sean Hooper, good question. So this is actually brought up by John J. Collins in his uh, book, as well as uh, the Dead Sea Scroll one, but mainly in the apocalyptic imagination. And I'm I'm going to butcher trying to explain it, but Jubilees is not Enochic, and uh, but even though it was found in Qumran literature. Um, it's more mosaic. So this is why it's not like one sect believed all this literature. There was a compilation of literature that was found in the Qumran caves. That's the thing about Qumran. If, for, from, if, if at the beginning people wanted to say, hey, this was this funky sect that was hanging out near the Dead Sea, right. boy, that's what we need to, that's what's been shattered. This literature is broad in scope. It was written by too many hands that could have actually been scribes at yes. Qumran. This comes from a broad area and over a long period of time and may represent a variety of Jewish opinions. The fact that they were deposited around 70 AD at the end of the first Jewish war tells us everything. These were probably placed there by the people who did control Jerusalem. And these were probably documents that they brought from Jerusalem and all over Judea. And we're not talking, if people have in their heads that the Dead Sea Scrolls are somehow this funky little sectarian group that uh, was just doing, no, they just the documents from he from Tanakh and Torah, just the actual documents of Hebrew literature that we have. These are the oldest complete versions that we have and multiple versions of every single text practically, but I think one of the traditional he, uh, Hebrew sacred texts are found in Qumran plus all these sectarian documents which uh, carbon dating tells us range from the second century BC, possibly up to the first century AD. So 
Yeah, no, you're right. And, and potentially a few of those documents might be um, late third, like right there at the beginning of second. So yeah. And, and, and first Enoch's made up of all these different dates as well, but yeah. Um, thank you, Mike Ainsworth. I hope I said your name, right? Thank you for the super chat, my friend. If you have a question, man, email me like anybody watching this tomorrow, I get to see dragons in Genesis. So thank you for that super chat, which just super chatted. By the way, I want to make this comment. If you start mowing the grass at 6 a.m. on Saturday, then you deserve to be stoned. That's a, that's a super important issue. Yeah. yeah. Were, you know? were you working in the field on a Saturday? Mm -mm. <sighs> in fact, it came to be understood after a certain moment of dusk on Friday night. <laughs> so, But the point is that if you worked on Saturday, if you actually were working in the field and doing physical labor of any sort, you were offending God. And obviously we got to, Derek, yeah. we're going to have to stone you, I'm afraid. Yeah, and I think that's a, a valid, a uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that that's, that's an eye for an eye. I mean, that's like, yeah, why the hell would you think it's okay to mow your grass on a Saturday, man? That's <laughs> something it, wrong with you. It's obviously a death penalty offense. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, like 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 wow. blaspheming, like saying Yahweh out loud. You yeah, know, that, if you're not the high priest at Yom Kippur in the Holy of Holies, if you say Yahweh out loud, obviously you should be killed for that. Too. I think Dr. Price has an interesting point. I think a lot of scholars would agree that like they just wanted to keep people from saying it, period, because they would swear on the name of the God. Right. But yeah. Um, well, there's a magical word implication, too. If I know the name of your God, I can get his attention. And so it, it, keeping this, the name of our God secret, has it's sort of like a military secret. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a CIA high, high intelligence, you know, uh, top secret stamp on it, uh, the name of God. Because if you know the name of our God, you can get his attention. It was a practice with the Roman army when they'd go conquer some people they'd learn about the religions of those people and they would try to really recruit the gods of those people to get them on their side and so the first thing they'd do is sort of make appeasement to the gods of the their enemy hey hmm. those guys working on our side <laughs> it's a really interesting approach uh if you think about it psychologically if you really do believe in gods if you really do believe that your god is sort of the one almighty god is you know, uh, at least in modern times, Jews believed. Uh, uh, how's that going to affect your psychology? How's that going to, you really believe it. It's going to affect your politics. It's going to affect the way you look at the news. It's going to affect your worldview. Mm. And that's inherently, that's another thing that we, if today we see people's worldviews and politics being affected by their religion, consider how all the more powerful that was 2,000 years ago, every political event had to be understood religiously, and every religious idea has political implications. That's just how it was. I mean, obviously, they were they lived in that kind. That was how they were set up completely in the ancient world. We're able to, to split that off here today, thankfully, uh, to some degree. It was all about the Jew. This is what Josephus and Tacitus and Suetonius all tell us. The whole thing that caused the Jewish war were these prophecies that the Jewish people had, these prophecies about a Messiah. And then we read Jewish documents. It's, no, our God and only our God, and that's the way it's going to be, and it's got to be. And if the, these our kings uh, start worshiping idols and marry foreign wives, that's the corruption. we got to be true to, to Torah and our, our one God. So you get the sheer gist of what went on, what caused the Jewish war. It mm. was religion and, ca and cause. These people really did believe that a Messiah would come to their rescue as God had promised them. And that's why it was important for the Romans, in my thinking, to come to understand that since it was the underlying motivation for a whole war. Mm. And therefore it became ultra critical in the first century for Romans to understand this religious motivation, just as it is for us today to understand the Islam of jihadists. So a couple things, everybody, uh, hit that like button, of course. There's 230 of you watching. I greatly appreciate you to hit that like button so far. We've been talking about the three scholars. Three. I had the number four. Three four. scholars. Oh, um, no, my, yeah, the fourth scholar is James. That's actually what I was going to say. And there was one like the son of man in the fire, and his name was James Stevens Valiant. 
um, <laughs> make sure you guys, of course, subscribe if you haven't. Join the Patreon. Guys, I got hundreds of videos that I haven't launched yet that are on Patreon of Dr. Price, uh, Mormonism series, and I'm going to keep keep bringing you the heat. So hit that like button. But James, do you have a picture or your book nearby you can show everybody so that anyone who's interested in hearing what you're saying more in depth can actually go check it out? I know you got the picture back there, right? Let me see. You must have the pic there. Oh, 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 oh snap! Oh, a poster. You see, my wife would not allow me to do interviews if I didn't have the posters of my books behind me. <laughs> Your wife is a very wise woman. Let me just say, she that. is a very wise woman. <laughs> uh, the smartest thing I ever did was to marry that lady twenty-four years ago. That is, mm. uh, yeah. There's the cover of Creating Christ I did with Warren Fay, um, and. Uh, we're trying to get a debate, guys. I'm working on it with uh, Richard Carrier, Dr. Carrier. I want to have him engage with you because, first of all, you're unlike any other Roman provenance guy that I know. And at the same time, uh, Dr. Carrier you know, has said that he would read your book and, of course, be able to engage with you. Whether it's a debate or a discussion, it doesn't matter. I would like to see him because he's going to approach it bottom up. And that's cool. That's fine. And you're going to approach it with a combination. So I'll be interested to hear what he has to say about your top-down stuff. What I follow is work. I mean, the thing yeah. about Carrier is that he talks about subjects in general. He's a uh, scholar of ancient science in general. And so I follow uh, uh, his work. For example, his recent blog post on the Roman economy and technology, we're, again, talk about lear still learning relearning what we've forgotten about the ancient world. The Ro ancient Roman economy was a heavily sophisticated. It had in highly organized industry. It had sophisticated trade. It had a form of capitalism, not exactly like ours, but it had an incredibly sophisticated economy. To underestimate, to think that these ancients were, you know, to underestimate the ancients uh, is a big mistake. The Romans had a sophisticated economy with complex trade, industry, division of labor, what we, in many characterizations of, of what we would think of as capitalist economy can be given to the ancient Roman economy. Um, science in the ancient world. We're just now coming to understand uh, the scientific understanding uh, of the ancient world because, you know, it was dismissed before, you know, these primitive uh, ancient people uh, really didn't understand what was going on. No, 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 no. We are now learning what we've forgotten that the ancients knew in terms of certain scientific things. Uh, I would be honored and uh, it would go beyond. Uh, I mean, I did send him a copy of the book. What was it? June of last year. Um, and uh, he did, he did say he would look at it. Um, and I am as patient as can be. I know that yep. there are a lot of hands on his time. Um, yep. and, uh, and I know too, that he's sort of bitten off his own, degree of radical position out there in the world. And um, because he's a peer reviewed scholar, I mean, he's a PhD, you know, who is a peer reviewed scholar and is, that's very important to him as well. Um, uh, I, I know that there will be uh, issues uh, maybe in even coming to terms with something as controversial as Roman uh, provenance. It is for everyone. It strikes a lot of people as a conspiracy theory um, mm -hmm. and uh, getting people to to think about it in a realistic way is already my first challenge so if he you know I get, as i say i'm patient i understand how radical my theory is he has to understand how radical some of his thinking is and how people have to we have to give people time to come around so i i give everyone uh, all the time that they need to come around to it uh he's a busy guy but as i say i really appreciate his own work and whether he takes the time to lift the pages of creating Christ or not, I will continue to follow his work uh, on the ancient world and ancient science. Uh, I think he does important work. Yeah. I don't always agree with him. I know I've taken specific. No, issue you're kidding. I'm with, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've taken specific issue with him in. He's one of the few scholars who we actually by name take on in, uh, you know, in creating Christ, we don't take a position on mythicism. We think it is a serious position, and therefore we stand outside of whether or not, in creating Christ at least, whether or not there was a historical Jesus or not. Um, his theory that Paul's original Jesus 
was actually a spiritual being crucified in some outer space dimension is a controversial one. Mm -hmm. I, it, it, I hear, you know, I've read the argument now in two or three different forms, and I see what he's saying. Paul was having visions of a supernatural Jesus. Mm -hmm. The supernatural Jesus surely existed in Paul's mind in one of these supernatural planes. The question is, did all of this activity about Jesus happen in this supernatural plane? Well, Dr. Carrier has a heck of an argument. He's correct. The Pauline epistles themselves have been interpolated. It's hard to understand which bits even... Uh, I mean, we know a couple of bits, and I agree with him about even the couple of bits that, that we know to be interpolated, and the, even the authentic, what are thought to be the authentic Pauline epistles. Uh, so it's even hard to sort it out because if if even our authentic Pauline epistles are condensations and mm -hmm. redacted and interpolated to the to a degree we don't know, we got a problem. Dude, but that is the problem Dr. Price brings <laughs> up every time I bring up Paul's epistles. He understands that C Carrier, of course, agrees with the seven authentic. But Dr. Price constantly says, you know, I'm afraid I think scholarship wants those seven. Because if they take away those seven, they have nothing to say. <laughs> well, so, like, you seven. know, they're kind of stuck. Well, but we are, we are at least stuck with at l this as a minimum. The first and second Corinthians, Romans, Galatians, Philippians, these things represent probably multiple letters that have been condensed, edited, redacted, condensed, squeezed into bits for us, so that what it strikes me, and as Carrier points out, interpolated. So even if we, we can infer, look, the authentic Pauline letters have a simpler theology than what we read in the Gospels. They appear to know practically nothing of the gospel's details of Jesus. Right. They appear in that sense to be evolutionarily more primitive in Christian literature. If that's the case, if those kind of inferences are true, then there may be a core to that material that precedes the gospels. Okay, I get that. But we still have the $64 question, what is it? Because what we have that are called the Pauline epistles include the pseudo epigrapha, a bunch of other letters that they claimed were written by Paul. This is Paul. This is Paul to the you know, Ephesians. Well, guess what? It's almost certainly not Paul to the Ephesians, but some dude claiming to be Paul to the Ephesians. Uh, if Since that's the, also the case, and since we know these things were messed with, redacted, edited, gone through, I mean, yeah. is there a Clementine redaction, a Marcionite redaction? Uh, uh, what do we have? Were there uh, conservative Christians who were trying to iron all this out in the second? I got to ask you something though, James. This is so important because you're you're bringing up something that touched me on um, when I read Barn Airman's Forged. And everyone watching right now, chime into the comment section. I want your honest thoughts of this. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you guys know this, and I'm sure if I ask Doctor Airman this, he might be able to answer this like this. But I had this. I'm going to try and explain it the best I can to make sense of what I'm trying to say. So first hit that like button. Got to plug the like. YouTube likes likes. Okay. You hit that like, they'd be like, yeah. Okay. Comment, share, like, comment, comment share. share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, comment. Comment. Okay. <laughs> Look, if you do it enough, it'll become a mantra. It'll become a religious movement. We'll start a church. We'll call it Myth Vision. You guys will be we'll completely go all over. Remember, contribute to Patreon, whatever you can too, to yeah, yeah, yeah. Patreon too. They have the coolest stuff and you get to hear it before anyone else gets to hear it. Well, I'm going to find more stuff to actually bring to the Patreon to help people too, by the way. I, I, I've got a Teespring account. I'm going to try and hook some people up who want to go for the higher rank uh, accounts helping us so you can get like a free t-shirt things like that i'm trying to work on that but i just got back from granny's so hit that like button here's my question here's my question everybody who's listening this is my question if you have heard of bart airman's or if you've actually read bart airman's book forged or forged and counter forgery um if you're aware of the arguments whatever i'd like your thoughts i asked dr price this and i don't know if he quite fully grasped what i was trying to ask here it is dr airman talks about forgeries he talks about things like faith, all right, in Paul. Paul writes and he says something about faith. He says, um, you know, you, faith, having grace through faith, not of works, and faith, not the faith. The later epistles already have bishops. They have things that show second, ten, uh, second century ideas in it, which shows that this is not written by Paul. Paul's long dead from the first century. Right. And New he, ideas have infiltrated and right. organizational issues about bishops and churches and, and these pastoral ones, right? So this is my this is my contention. 
Yeah. If, if what Dr. Ehrman is saying in misquoting Jesus is we don't have originals, we don't have copies of the originals, we don't have copies of the copies of the copies of the originals, it comes much later, 100, potentially a couple hundred years later, how do we know those seven are actually the first guy, Paul, and they're not some type of redacted or something else that came later? How do we trust to start with, well, we know these are authentically Paul? And that's a serious question. I, I I don't know, and maybe I just can't wrap my head around it. Why are why is Galatians really Paul? There are, you know I mean? there are literally what we have to literally do is sort of the inferences that I was laying out before. The Pauline epistles do appear to be ignorant of most of the material in the Gospels, and if even if it was messed with after we have gospel material, it wasn't messed with to the point that they could layer in, that they felt any confidence about layering in all of this gospel material that I'm sure they would have loved to have given Paul credit for. So there, even in their minds, the Pauline material was somehow more basic and simple than the gospels, and they couldn't mess with it to that degree, even though we know they were messing with their own literature to a huge degree in the second and third century. If they didn't do that, if they weren't constantly trying to prop up Christianity, interpolate into Josephus, let's say, and try to like do anything to cover the tracks and defend it. Oh, there's like my buddy the, yesterday sitting in this garage. There's 300 other witnesses outside of the Bible. And I'm like, 300 I account witnesses of Jesus' resurrection outside of the Bible. Where are you coming up with this? Can we rely on anything Josephus says? Even if there was an original testimonium, we know Christians messed with Josephus, our, who could be the only first century his, you know, secular historian or pagan historian or Jewish historian outside of Christian literature itself to mention Jesus at all, could be in the antiquities of Josephus. Oh my gosh, wouldn't that be valuable to have a yeah. non-New Testament kind of source? But no, Christians messed with the testimonium. And then we go to second century sources uh, that are not Christian sources, uh, Tacitus or, 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 or plenty. People will say, maybe Christians have messed with those. Yeah. Or maybe Tacitus himself was reliant on something of Josephus that we're not, that we don't have. If you can't realize that our earliest mentions, the very earliest mentions, say Tacitus, he's not talking so much about Jesus as a Christian movement that already exists. Even if we take Tacitus is, you know, an early mention, but that's an early second century mention. Just like Pliny's letter to Trajan, you know, it's an early second century mention. What do I do with these Christians in Bithynia? Trajan, uh, this is what I've been doing so far. Let me know if I'm doing the right thing. Mm. How do I handle Christians? Now, those are like our earliest, earliest references. And what they're talking about are is a movement of Christians more than even a Jesus. We don't really have concrete evidence of a, a Jesus in the first century from anything first century other than what we might be able to infer is first century in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Whatever original bits of Paul do go back to say before. The and that's war. what I'm trying to figure. I'm not trying to be hyper skeptic to a point where I'm not allowing the possibility that this is, a, this was really pinned by Paul. Yeah. Uh, but my, my, I guess my question isn't to try and poke. It's, it, I think a valid question is to say, how do we know that that, because we know that there were writers in the name of Paul. Okay, we we or at least they're writing. We know it's whoever yeah. wrote Ephesians didn't Paul write Galatians. Themselves, Paul, as they were writing. Right. Away. <laughs> so we know that later, like we know Ephesians wasn't written by Paul. Colossians. We know that there's evidence to say, ah, come on. But how do we know that that earlier stuff that appears like it doesn't have the later material? How do we know that that was Paul and not someone writing in the name of Paul on Paul's behalf and in, in an earlier time or something? I don't know. You know what I mean? And it could be affected by interpolation. The same people who wrote in the name of Paul may be inserting stuff in there, taking stuff out, compressing stuff. I'm that's, and I, I really think uh, that is how we have to kind of look at these uh, Pauline letters as sort of compressions and edited, redacted bits of his letter letters to the mm -hmm. Corinthians, his letters to the Romans in some cases. Um, either that or we have a lot of hands that have intervened in the meantime. I think that's what Dr. Price thinks. Yeah. 
And even in the texts themselves, we have controversy in the Pauline letters. You know, uh, Paul will say to the Corinthians, don't you get sucked in by different movements? Some people say they're for Apollos and some people say they're for this guy. No, 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 forget divisions. So here he is saying, forget divisions and actually naming division leaders at the time, right there in Corinthians. So even this doctrine that you, whoever this original Paul guy might be, is a controversial angle in one movement. So what we call authentic Pauline Christianity is just his version of right, this. Right, 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 It'd be right. interesting to hear, what, what was this cat Apollos? What was his version of Christianity? Hmm. What did he think about Jesus? Yeah. The one that Paul is saying to the Corinthians, don't, you know, ignore divisions. We're all that's, basically saying the same thing. That's what's so fascinating because when you start delving into the scholarship, you find out like John J. Collins and someone just posted like, I don't trust the Christian literature. I trust the Jewish literature. I understand why they're doing that, but they're probably practicing Jews. But here's the problem with that. All you need to do is read, read this book right here. Covers plenty for you to see in the Qumran sect, the Qumran uh, scrolls, going into all the apocalyptic sectarian literature. And then, of course, read the, uh, he's got it on Audible. You guys can really check it out and see how, you know, we had the Septuagint. We've got obviously some Hebrew version. We also have the uh, the Samaritans were using the um, the Samaritan version of uh, the the Bible. I think it's called the Samaritan Pentateuch, if I'm understanding that correctly. And yeah. they're not the they same on the on the Pentateuch, mind you. They had their own angle on Judaism as such, and contemporary Jews regarded them as funky. Well, some of these passages, though, to get into the critical stuff, is like some of these passages. Let's say Isaiah 45. You can in the Qumran scrolls, we find other of the same supposed quotations that don't match. So you got to go, well, how do you trust which ones you're going to trust? Are we going to play? Well, the Holy Spirit led us down to the Masoretic version and we have it correct, just like the church wants to say the King Septuagint. James version is the correct version. But the Septuagint had sacred status in the ancient world, too. The legend is that the 72 scholars went off and magically came up with the exact same translation of the Torah. And therefore, it was there. It, so if the, there are differences between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint, we can't assume that the Septuagint is inferior. Even in the ancient world, it had sacred yeah. status. The, Sep the Greek version done in Hellenistic Egypt had sacred status to Jews. Uh, mm -hmm. We can't forget that uh, yeah. because the Septuagint is a magical, miraculous thing itself, the Greek translation of the, the Torah. So, wow, you, to think of it in those terms is... I mean, just looking, as you pointed out, the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have a variety of perspectives. The truth is, with Christian literature, we have a variety of perspectives, too, don't we? The epistle of, uh, ascribed to James contradicts what we hear from the epistles ascribed to Paul. You know what? You of salvation. You excite me with that. You brought up James. I got to say, this is funny. After listening to Forge by Dr. Ehrman, he points out that James is a forgery in the name of James, attacking Ephesians, which is a forgery in the name of Paul. Catch the power of that, guys. I know. By forgery, I would hasten to add, that doesn't mean that there isn't material in both that doesn't go back. Yes, Ephesians add stuff to what right. Paul was saying. And yeah. James adds stuff to whoever <laughs> this cat James that the original Paul was arguing with was saying. So that's the really wild thing. Whoever's writing Ephesians is saying, boy, if Paul was around today, he would have added all this other stuff. Yeah. And whoever's writing our version of James is like, boy, if James, the enemy of Paul, was around today, <laughs> he would have said something like this. Literally. And so it's like they're channeling their hero. Yeah. Another generation. Oh, my God. You know, like in grandpa's time, they lived, but I'm channeling them now. Joel, just in case you're wondering, uh, you know, he says the Lambert of God, the myth, vision, Messiah. I'm not performing miracles today unless I'm I'm getting shekels. That's not happening. Um, it's just not. It's just part of the, you know, you want to see a miracle, it's going to cost you. So thank you, Joel, for pointing out a fact. And it was not flesh and blood that revealed this to you, Joel. My father, which is in heaven. Okay. So thank you. <laughs> wow. I love that. The Lambert of God. But you are not a sacrificial Lambert. No. no. <laughs> I love that. I'm the guy coming in Revelations, hair white as wool, eyes a flame of fire. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like my feet were like fine brats as it burned in a furnace. That would be a cool look. 
you know, with your garments shining and your eyes with fire and white. Oh man, that that it's got to be the most dramatic look. Yeah, the revelation look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I think that's trying to obviously trying to fulfill things that didn't happen the first go around, according to the narrative. So it's obvious they got to have a badass come in revelation. Come on, most prophecies are written after the event. In fact, usually in the wake of the event that they're allegedly crediting to the prophet who lived before the event. Uh, boy, we were warned. They warned us. They told us. Gosh. That's the best way to convince someone that it's true. Right. Is, is ex eventu. And that's something that he goes into, Dr. Jan, John J. Collins. I, that's one of the reasons I want to get him on, James. I could talk yeah. about all the stuff he goes over in this, but I want to point out the failures. I want to point out, like, obvious, ha-ha, we caught you, ex eventu. You wrote it after the fact. You, you made it sound like it was predicted, but really – all the events happened and you're just writing it after we catch Daniel red handed, like two kids red. in the back of a church, you know, more than once <laughs> Daniel got caught with his pants down. Look, um, ah, it's too bright. Let me see this chart right here in this book. Yeah. He goes into, and he has dots for like cosmogony, primordial events, recollection of past ex eventu prophecy, persecution, other eschatological upheavals, judgment, destruction of the wicked judgment, destruction of the world, Judgment, destruction of otherworldly beings, cosmic transformation, resurrection, and other forms of afterlife. And not all these books match, but you get to see like the overlap of books. Uh, Apocalypse of uh, Ze Zephaniah, uh, T. Abraham, 3 Baruch, T. Uh, T. Levi, 2 through 5, 2 Enoch, Similitudes, a Astronomical Book, 1 Enoch, 1 through 36, Apocalypse of Abraham, 2 Baruch. For Ezra, Jubilees, Apocalypse of Weeks, Animal Apocalypse, and Daniel, of course. And that's wow. just a start. He didn't, that's not all. That's just a small chart of some of the stuff. Literature was important back then. Yeah. I, I, I think, think maybe a little. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, and let's, let's, I can't resist. Give me a moment to, to comment on Mark 13. Please. We're supposed to believe that every event in Mark 13 about the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple had happened. And serious scholars and serious minds just can't swallow that. Uh, it Mark 13 was written after the event. I would just observe that if it is ex eventu, which I do believe it is, then the glorious coming of the Son of Man is ex eventu in the mind of whoever is writing Mark 13. He couldn't leave something like that as a shoe to fall. That's not That's the way. That's what I'm wondering. That's, That's what I'm wondering. Religious prophecies work. The Son I of Man came just like the temple was destroyed. I have a hard time swallowing that pill, and I'm going to tell you why. That's okay. possible in the Gospels, or at least I'll say in two, maybe three, if we count Luke into that. But John doesn't care about it because in Second Peter, the forgery of Peter, they're still waiting and embarrassed that he hasn't come yet. So maybe there are splinter sects of, of Christian movements here that have a different take on this because if you read – the Gospel of Thomas in Thomas, you know, obviously he's more Gnostic, probably comes a little later. I don't know. Second century. Um, the disciples say, when will the repose of the dead, the resurrection of the dead, when's it going to happen? And Jesus says, look around. It's already happened. You it's just can't happened. see it. Right. You can't see it. Now, that's the biggest cop out BS I've ever um, heard. They're obviously coping. And at some point, think of it, the further away from the see, once you've this is the key here. Let me. I think this is why the, the magic has to go this way. If Ro, if Mark thirteen is all ex eventu, whoever wrote Mark thirteen had a son of man in mind. That son of man did not pan out for second century Christians, though. We have to dissociate whatever that glorious coming of the son of man was, but was ex eventu from the event. So if that's the case, we're sitting here now saying, oh. Crap! We don't have a you know a second glorious coming yet. When's it happening? It didn't happen within the lifetime of his listeners, as Jesus so clearly said in Mark thirteen. It would happen. So Jesus's timing is wrong at the very least. That's what makes me wonder. Like, what was Mark's? What was the author Mark thinking in Mark thirteen? What was Matthew thinking in Matthew twenty four? And then what was Luke thinking? Luke started to kind of drop the ball. That's the whole point is yeah. that they. They seem to be gently stepping away. Away from that thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
well, you know, uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> oh, sure, but. And then by, <laughs> by the time you get to later Christian literature, is it really surprising at all that we're now in a full-on panic mode that, well, but you're, I think that there is an easier explanation that we have different views of it too that are being ironed out in Christian literature in the second century. It could be that there are apocalyptic Jews who never buy into some view of a, a messianic advent that really did happen in the first century, whether it was Flavian or whether it was some rebel leader or what. There may have been Jews who were just still waiting, expecting a messianic advent right then that never were satisfied. Oh, Imagine, look, look at the poor psychology of that kind of uh, Jewish messianic. They never had a messiah. They were just expecting messiah. <laughs> and he just never came around. Look at this right here. There's this. There's the passage right after the apocalypse in Mark and Matthew that not even the Son of Man knows. So they're already backpedaling, according back to awesome Matt Awesome. That is a fact. That's they're interesting. I, I, because that when reading this book, I keep saying it. It's important. This is why I want to get him on the show. The 2nd of April, Dr. John J. Collins is coming on. Um, I can't wait to delve into this because there are so – like if 99% of this apocalyptic genre and – and there's different kinds, historical apocalyptic genre – there's and he goes into what that means in this book. He breaks down what all these books that we're finding that are in the Qumran sect and outside of that, uh, various different ideas, the book of Revelation, everything. They anticipated a real situation. Like, like let me put it like this: they thought evil was gonna have an end, justice was supposed to come. What does that mean to a small pocket of people inside of a Jerusalem temple only? Yeah, well, That's we... not the picture that these right. guys thought. They thought there was going to be a real change here on earth right um order yeah a new, a new millennium of justice you can't read some of this apocalyptic literature without getting the clear idea that what's being predicted is a new age will dawn in which justice occurs finally cosmic justice will, will occur and that is a major theme in this literature mm -hmm. that somehow god will change things it'll come with a big you know explosion it, you'll no one will miss it. It's big, whatever it is. It, you see, it's talked about in al one of the difficult things about it and pinning it down is it's talked about in allegorical terms. It's talked about just as I say in Daniel in terms of beasts and the Son of Man, and it's a it's a vision. It's like a cartoon in someone's head. It's not really a uh, concrete thing. All we're given is sort of this idea that boy, something big is going to happen. We're going to—it's going to be a big old explosion, and there'll be a whole new—the dawning of a whole new age in which justice has finally arrived. And wow, and, yeah, and it, it came to be seen as <laughs> justice for the dead too. The bad guys are going to get what they deserve. The good guys are going to get what they deserve. It'll all be worked out by God when this thing, whatever it is, this great event happens, and there's different ways of looking at it, and there's different allegorical ways of explaining it. Um, mm. And those are the things that give us the evidence, the signature, if you will, as to where it stands in the ideology or in the development of apocalypse. I you just know. tried to. I just tried to see if if Shannon Q wanted to come on. She's at work right now. She's just been commenting uh, interesting stuff. She said, um, "Shannon, we got to get you back on here. That was such a fun show we did last time." No, you're you're right. I was in that strange. I like to call it cult. I guess I mean it derogatory and not derogatory at the same time because it's like a theological movement that the end did happen. Jesus' the second coming did happen. Like we try. What we were doing was saving the savior. They were we were saving the savior from being a failure. It's and a desperate form of apologetics. If we find contradictions, let's see, take what the fellow just pointed out. Jesus in Mark thirteen appears to be quite clear that the glorious coming of the Son of Man will occur in conjunction with the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem, and it'll happen within a generation, within the lifetimes of some listening to him. He makes that explicitly plain. But then he says, oh, but the, no one really knows. But right. <laughs> okay, so no one can really tell us exactly when it's going to happen. Right. Okay, they're backing away. There's a sort of, in other words, they are already feeling the tension of that having not really panned out in some sense, at least for some people. So they have to start backing away from this idea, although in my view, 
as stated, it had to be ex eventu to something. Somebody had to actually believe in a messianic advent. Uh, you know, we read in Josephus that he says there were armies seen fighting in the clouds at the siege of Jerusalem. For him, that is the Daniel vision. But for him, Vespasian is the Messiah. I want to show you this. This is this is definitely a must show. Let me let me pull it up here. I'm going to actually share the screen because we're talking about Mark. Obviously, Matthew to me is that's a strange gospel too. By the way, Matthew does a whole Jewish thing, extremely Jewish. Let me well, share this with you guys. The, obviously, Matthew is not happy with how un-Jewish Paul and Mark have been. And so, seems what does be this mean to you? Correct. <laughs> what does this mean to you, James? When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now, I don't think it takes 40 years for them to travel and preach this gospel in the towns of Israel. Hmm. Hmm. I honestly think that the uh, much of the material we have here is direct rebel material. I'm not, uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if that is Oberdedicta from some messianic rebel from the first Jewish war. Doesn't that, doesn't that sound like to you? It, either that, or even if they weren't like a rebel fighting, they had this weird, very soon ending where the battle yeah. was going to happen. The Son of Man was going to come. That's a confession of political activity going on, right? In my view, yeah. But I mean, I, either way, I, I think it's like that. When they persecute you, flee, go to the next town. Right. What we're talking about is a politically, uh, a political, a group of political sectarians, a, a group of radicals. A group of uh, you know uh, weather underground sort of uh, Antifa types, if you believe in Antifa. It, it, it's these are this is obviously a political insurgency. This is the language of political insurgency. If you are persecuted in one town, flee, go to the next town, but you want to spread the message there too, the propaganda message. So in other words, something is catching on underground, and it is a political religious political movement that appears to be echoed. There are bits when, in my view, it's clear that what we're hearing is an echo of some rebel thinker. It also is bouncing that idea from Daniel. Son of man, son of man will come, son of man will come. Exactly. Uh, oh, Daniel, oh, apocalypse is the language of these rebels. It's paradoxical if we find a pro-peace apocalypse. Apocalypse is about a war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness and some cataclysm at the end of time. Yeah. When you're talking about the final showdown, we're talking about militants. We're talking about, we're not talking about, this is the genre of the Jewish rebels. This is the genre of the Maccabees. Mm. This is the genre of Jewish nationalism. The, yeah. Because they're invoking the prophets. They're invoking Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea. They're invoking this prophetic tradition too, which is a nationalistic one, a Torah right. Orthodox one. I gotta make a jab at at Calvinism for a second here, though. Sure. Okay, this sectarian literature that we're finding in the Qumran scrolls from John J. Collins, I keep bringing up. I'm because it's like the most recent book I've been yeah. reading. Yeah. You know how it is. You read a book, it's like I gotta tell everyone about this one book I'm reading. <laughs> you know, chapter two, and it's, yeah, yeah. So he points out though that in these Qumran, you know, sectarian, some of the literature that. Their God, uh, predestined, if you will, predetermined the sons of light and sons of darkness, like, like a super lapsarian Calvinist, okay? And what he means isn't the backpedaling that Calvinists like to do. Well, that first initial sin, there was a freedom of some sort. But after that, uh, they, were, they, they did it to themselves. No, they don't backpedal. They say God created this person for darkness this person for light and it's predetermined God to the end. We're going to sin. God knew it all. That well, he awesome. planned it. He like planned purposely it. set this up. Yeah. Right. And so they don't backpedal like modern Calvinists like to do. But, they like to backpedal. They have their determinism and free will at the same time. Yeah. Well, the first step was free will. After free that, will. it's all determined. Right. It's then like, it's all determinism. <laughs> quit being like weak and stand strong in your views. Oh, we are standing strong. God never actively forces people to be wicked. He just right. has to pull away his spirit of grace and it causes them to go down the path of wickedness. 
that's really strange. I mean, he actively hardened Pharaoh's heart. Why can't we at least, uh, you know, go out of our way to talk like that? I don't know. He just liked that, didn't he? Yeah. So he made us such that if he backed away a little bit, we'd, we'd be, because we all are and they're innately corrupt and in need of redemption. So if that's the contradiction here, I don't, you know, it's really hard to blame me for something that I, I couldn't have changed or that was predetermined <laughs> or that Adam and Eve did generations ago or that's built into my nature or or give take Jesus the lust in my heart look I'm a biological organism I'm an animal a human being can you they had to do just the studies how many times a day does the average adult male think about sex don't <laughs> ask me I plead the fifth <laughs> exactly I, but the point is that Jesus says, you, you've heard it said that thou shalt not commit adultery. I tell you, if you lust in your heart, you've already sinned. Oh, gosh. What kind of a chance does that give anybody? All of us go through the, mul sinning multiple times a day or human, just by our human nature. So, hey, wait, that doesn't seem fair. So if, if I am innately corrupt, if my emotional mechanism makes me evil and I can't help it, if my ancestors made me evil, in need of redemption and I can't help it. It's not my doing. It's not my fault. Whoever would punish me for that is just a son of a bitch. I mean, look, Paul would differ, man. Who are you, oh man, to answer back to God? <laughs> Does the thing form say to its maker, why have you made me thus? Notice I'm using the King James. Why have you made me thus? The King James version only, guys, you better stick to it. Or you're going to hell. <laughs> um, no, but like seriously, it, it, I think it's interesting. It's funny, um, and I've seen Calvinists. Aristotle understood that you really can't praise or blame someone for something that they didn't choose. If it's not a choice, if it's not something you have chosen, it makes no sense. That's what's wrong with racism, right? You're not you're born white. If I were to say, you know, it was really rotten of you to be born a Caucasian, Derek. Right. Be, it makes no sense. There's no sense in morally evaluating something uh, that you can't have chosen, an unchosen thing. You were born a male. How dare you be born biologically male, Derek? Well, it, geez, I didn't. It was, it was just the way I came out. <laughs> you know, um, and until modern medicine, there was nothing we could much do about it. Um, so there's something to it. I don't regard there to be any significant difference between the races. But the point is that it's outside of human choice. And if it's outside of human choice, if I really can't help it, blaming me or praising me for it utterly makes no sense. In fact, it's wrong. It's a wrong way of looking at morality. Only to the extent I was in control of the situation, aware of the situation, could have made a difference, could have mm -hmm. done something otherwise. Does it make any sense for you to criticize me? There's no world of criticism or moral or normative evaluation that doesn't presuppose choice, real choice. And if it's in any sense deterministic, you've, but to that degree, purged any moral element, any judging element of it from my mind. There's no way I can evaluate you for having two eyes. It's just the way you were born, Derek, uh, mm -hmm. darn ya. Uh, so so <laughs> the, what, what it always catches me to believe that in an omniscient God creates a necessary problem for ethics as such. First, you want people to make the right choices, but then you tell me it's all predestined and God had it all worked out from the beginning because God knows everything and he can do anything and he created everything. Yeah, but he doesn't and he does and he doesn't and he does. And I say that because all you got to do if you want to use the fundamentalist approach, speaking of which, uh, in case you don't know, red flag, fundamentalism is a train wreck. I do 100% agree. But that's why we have open theist because it seems like God is kind of repenting that he made man like, gosh, Dag nabbit, you guys fell. Now I got to flood all of you, drown all of you but eight people. <laughs> boy, Why the hell did you do this? Boy, you screwed up first the Garden of Eden, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was quite a setup, though, right? You can eat from any of the fruit in the garden. Anything. This one tree. This don't one eat tree. this amazing tree over here. <laughs> Talk about don't a setup. It. Talk about a <laughs> I mean, it's the it literally what's the saying forbidden fruit is the most tempting. Yes. Right? You, this God has totally set them up in the garden. What I man, I tell my kids, do not take my Pepsi. I'll get like Pepsi for the house. It's I gone. tell them and I literally tell them it's in my well, I don't know why I do this. By saying it, you put a spotlight on your Pepsi.
I have no more Pepsi. <laughs> You're getting flooded, assholes. You're getting. Hey, <laughs> God, you have to know how to. You have to know how to be a good, wise God. <laughs> Ro Robert, thank you for the compliment, man. Whenever I look at Derek, I guess I sin. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate all the compliments I get. I don't care who you are. You know what I mean? That's, thank you. But no, yeah, dude, it's silly. I think it's fun. But that's why I love this stuff. It's kind of like I believed this shit literally. Like, really? And now I'm like, okay, hold on. Genesis is using Mesopotamian mythology. Hold on. We're talking Epic of Gilgamesh narratives. And Noah and showing like this sacred plant at the bottom of this water. He's got to swim down and get it. And it's going to give you eternal life. He takes a nap and a snake steals it away. I mean, you start looking at Genesis and you go, what's going on? I love decoding this stuff. Like, I love to decipher what's really happening here. And well, modern, so. I feel like modern people who believe this stuff and can't let go of it, though, yeah. they want they want to allegorize all of it so that they go, well, you're just not understanding it. Its initial intent did not have any literal significance. Death wasn't literal. This wasn't the first literal man and woman. Like Everything becomes allegory to a point where it's to protect the text. It's to protect your belief in the story. To, let's already, keep the Bible. They were all, when Greek ideas and Jewish ideas were coming together, they were already starting to back away. Philo was all, now Philo wasn't denying the literal interpretation of Hebrew scripture. On the other hand, he was opening up this whole allegorical way we could look at Hebrew literature. You know, I mean, it's this, this giant parable that God is Good teaching point. us here. And they're already, think of it, 2,000 years ago, already starting to allegorize and parabolize what's going on here. Um, you know, now, I think Philo did believe in a literal Genesis in one sense, and he's definitely telling us that in some sense. But he's also telling us that there's this allegorical way of looking at Hebrew scripture. And so it's interesting how for the last 2,000 years, they've been more and more stepping away to this allegorical sense. If you'd asked a fundamentalist, you know, uh, even, of course, millions of fundamentalists even today, if you ask them this, did God create everything in six days? Yes, six days. And he rested on the seventh. And that was the order in which he created them. And he created them by his say-so. And God said, let there be. And that's how it came to be. Well, now you know it's not six literal 24-hour days. See? Now, ask William Lane Craig. He'll correct you. There's six, six epochs of time. Epochs of time. And, and, and make sure evolution finds its way into this as well. Because, you know. Well, uh, before the sun and the moon, what's a day? Yes. <laughs> so, but a day is a day. And a day was thought to be a day by whoever was originally writing Genesis. So let's not play games. They wouldn't have said it that way. They didn't mean it for us to be understood that way. There was this chaos, this disorder, and God brought order to it in six days. And that's the meaning of it. Now, there appear to be two creation myths sort of stitched together in early Genesis. But come on, whoever wrote Genesis wants us to believe that God really did bring order in six days to this aquatic chaos that originally he confronted <laughs> mm. it was by god's command god said let there be light and that's what made light and god said let there be let there be like a like a king what's really interesting is that the different creation myths are very fascinating to understand uh i think we've talked about it before you, you know the ancient greeks believed father sky lay, mother on, earth. Lay, lay on top of mother earth his fluids get into her cracks and up springs life it's a very biological, organic view. Anthropomorphized of, of nature. Anthropomorphized right. nature itself. Yeah, they're just like mom and dad making babies. Yeah, doesn't it make sense? It's an organic, biological, makes perfect sense. Uh, whereas in Genesis, God is like a king issuing commands and laws. And just as a king makes things happen by his command, so God makes things happen by saying, let this happen. So there you've got a sort of monarch model as opposed to a sort of organic reproductive model of creation. Uh, but it's very interesting to see the different forms of uh, creation myth because they're really not scientific at all. Yeah. There are uh, forms of how consciousness brought existence into being, as I've pointed out many times before. That's all, all this is, is a projection. God, gods, it's all just a projection of human consciousness onto the universe. We have to learn that only we have this unique kind of consciousness, this self-awareness.
uh, that uh, the universe doesn't. Science, yeah, I mean, and, and if it does, we don't know. <laughs> yeah, science well, begins when we leave the gods out of our explanations for things. Science begins when we have a explanation that excludes the gods and is based on our observation of what's ca actually causing what. I have to go ahead and um, let everybody know to lay off my Pepsi, okay? You're talking shit about my Pepsi. It's not <laughs> I know the names on the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay. I could, I've got an eraser. I've got an eraser. Um, I'm just teasing. So someone asked, they, they wanted to know near death experiences. Um, and so we have Michael Shermer, of course, who's on the, the poster of this thumbnail. Can you give us a little bit? I mean, obviously, first of all, I want to say this, and then maybe you can grab it from here. You always have some good insight when it comes to the physical stuff. It's a near death experience. It's not a death death experience. So you're not dead dead. If you they know. were dead, then they wouldn't come back to report anything to us about exactly. what they experienced. Now some people are trying to argue. Operating yeah. table. Now that medicine is such that our hearts can stop for periods of time that they could not previously. We can resuscitate people in ways that we could not resuscitate them before. And uh, we can keep them semi-alive in ways that we couldn't before. And death is not a light switch either. You know, just look, we, you know, the, the old uh, uh, Greek logical thing, uh, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Well, how do we know all men are mortal? Well, one of the ways we know is that all animals die. It's not just humans. How else do we know? Well, people get old and they decay. And their memories go and they get wrinkled. And then, you know, when you look at people age, there really can only be one natural end to all, terminus to all that, <laughs> the, com the complete death of the, the being in question. I was going to say apotheosis, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the point is that we wind down and, and die and we have a finite life. And even at the last minute of death, it's not a sudden light switch going off. It's like the functions, and you're like Hal in 2001, the, the mental functions as he's shutting Hal's computer down. I'm disappearing, Hal, Dave. <laughs> I'm, I'm right, what is he saying? I'm forgetting or something or some word and do that where Hal is losing his consciousness. I think death is probably, more, natural death is probably more like that. Think of it, we have semi-states like sleep too. We have semi-states of hypnosis. Or, or, or when drugs put us into to a semi-conscious state, it's not as though there's an on-off switch. It's like consciousness has a dimmer switch, if you will. And sometimes when our consciousness and our brain activity gets down to low dim activity, what's going on is still an activity. We're not dead. Something is still going on in our brain, but it's not working like like it should to say, ah, I can. Oh, I'm having an interview right now with Derek Lambert uh, over the internet. I can't put that together. My brain isn't working well enough for me to get my actual context. And so when I come out of it, my brain fills in a context. You know, it's like with those optical illusions where from a distance, they don't fill in the edges, but you see the object as if it was the object right. because your mind wants to see it. Your mind automatically puts it together uh, because it's used, first of all, it's trained, but there could be something even in our brain itself that puts certain things together because that's, you know, an integration that we automatically, do, our brains automatically do for us. And so what's interesting is the variations in near-death experience. As I say, if you come from an Eastern religious experience, you'll have a totally different view of the afterlife in that near-death experience than someone who comes, say, from a European Christian uh, background. Uh, your actual philosophy. What's interesting is that it, you can be an atheist who was raised Christian and maybe have a Satan and hell experience like Dante's Inferno. But you see, it's you're coming from the culture, the same culture that produced Dante's Inferno. And that's what's filling in the gaps. That's sort of the Jurassic Park frog DNA. Now, I'm wondering when we're going to get back to executing people for not believing in the Trinity, because that's that's the truth, right? I'm just, right. I'm just kidding. Right. Well, Shannon, Q, Shannon Q is also really smart with the whole physiological and the mind or the brain. I like to use that term, but um, my, my friend scripture Rippa's check this out. Uh, Michael Shermer talked about this in his book and uh, that whole, we had this, like there was this thing that was going around saying when you die, like you literally 
immediately lose weight. Like there's weight to your soul, right? There's this like folklore, if you will, that's gone around and people saying that they've shown that not to be the case. Obviously he said they've done tons of measurements and it was one guy that supposedly said this and everyone who went to like re experiment and test this, they all come back and go, no, there's no weight loss there. So I love how we create exactly the mass of a soul was. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love how we create these stories. Like, I don't know um, what that's called, but like urban legends that we have that we just, it just takes one time for when you're like 10 years old to hear it or when you're a teenager and you hear it from someone and it gets passed around. And a lot of that stuff, I was getting schooled in Michael Shermer's book, The Believing Brain. I was like, dude, this guy's super sharp. He, he, he really goes in all of it. You have to believe to act. And we do have a conscious mechanism that works. That is to say, when I'm always astonished when I'm driving down a highway, you know, four lanes on either side, and everyone's going 60, 70, 80 miles an hour down a highway, and you've got hundreds of cars literally on the road. I see dozens going in my direction, dozens going in the other direction. Everyone's staying in their lane. Everyone's operating a vehicle. It is mind blowing. Their consciousness obviously is working very accurately. Otherwise, we'd be having crashes all over the place. I couldn't walk along the cliffs at the beach without falling over if it wasn't. And, you know, we have to believe to act. Uh, to paraphrase Aristotle, why is it that, a, that we always head in the exact direction of the supermarket whenever we want to go to the supermarket? Well, that's the only direction that's going to get us to the supermarket. And that belief, you know, gosh, wow, turns out to be true. Turns out wow. to be true that they left the supermarket in the same place they did what? last. No <laughs> way. Exactly. No, and more than that, <laughs> we can land on the moon on a dime every time. We now have the science that allows us to shoot a god darn rocket out of the gravitational influence of the Earth millions of <laughs> kilometers away, yeah. land on another body out there in the solar system on a dime hey the next time you say god darn again we're, we're gonna have a problem but please continue <laughs> so, raised all shucks a christian and it still has its effect doesn't it no, you know i kind of wonder what and i suspect i don't really engage with many people who who are flat earthers but i really wonder asking you know do they think the entire Mars thing we've got going on right now with the rover on Mars, do they think that's completely like somewhere out in the deserts of Arizona? And like, are they, is this all like CGI or is that stuff yeah. that they, Amazing. I don't know. Long before CGI too, we were sending up rockets back in the fifties with cameras on them, which would take you outside of the earth's atmosphere and could show you the curvature of the earth just in a rocket right there. And anyone could shoot up a rocket. You can do it in your backyard right now. Put a little, and now we've got these GoPro cameras. You can actually put a little GoPro camera on a little rocket and you could get high enough into the atmosphere. You can actually see the curvature of the earth. If you doubt all these people, maybe there's, uh, I don't know, maybe they'll think that the GoPro cameras all have some, there's some conspiracy behind, you know, uh, uh, some implanted, uh, embedded technology into all GoPro cameras that will fool you into thinking that your GoPro camera on a rocket is deceiving you to think that the earth is curved. I got to no. say something here. Dragons in Genesis said he has a brother that's flat earther, right? I, got a lot, I, I talk to people all the time that tend to be that. I just bump into them through Facebook or whatever. Yeah. That Israel only group that we've engaged over the past few years, you will be shocked at how many of them are flat earthers. Flat earthers. Yeah. And I'm like, I wonder what's going on with that. Because in that book, Michael Shermer's book, The Believing Brain, he has like a whole section on conspiracy theories from 9-11 to you name it. And he like goes into why they do what they do, why they think that way and why they get into that kind of stuff. I just thought it was really interesting. Got and go logically demonstrate. Now in ancient Egypt, hundreds of years BC, they demonstrated <laughs> that the earth was a sphere simply from the observations they could make of shadows on the ground. Mm. You compare shadows in one spot of Egypt to another spot of Egypt, you know, there's one day a year where the, the sticks cast no shadows and suns and the sun reflected on the bottom of wells. One day a year. And it's not the same day 100 miles, 200 miles away. In fact, the further away you get from that, the greater the difference in the day is. But there is that one day that happens. Because we're out in the desert. It was an easy, easy observation. Yeah. 
Yeah, because so they're straight over. You don't have a shadow or much of a shadow at all. Unless and the then, surface is curved, you won't have this phenomenon of right. of the same day where there's no shadow being different. That means that the sun is either passing over us or the earth is turning. In some way or another, we've got a curved surface here and there's movement. And they actually could get this. By learning a little basic math, they compared the differences in the shadow shapes and compared that to the distance in the, right? The shadow is this much different with this much difference. It's space different between this town and this town. And by doing that and figuring out, you know, a little circle, geometry, yeah. yeah circle has 360 degrees. We figure out what the distance of one degree is, multiply it by 360, and we can figure out how the circumference of the earth. And guess what? The ancients, 2,000 years ago, within a reasonable degree of accuracy, calculated the circumference of the earth before the birth of Christ based on observations of shadows on the earth. Not only do I know it's a sphere, I can tell you how big the thing is. <laughs> look, look at this comment. Do you see this? Derek dealing flat earthers is my own. Yeah. And I don't and, and I'm not trying well, to draw that attention. Well, yeah. Well, you know, I don't mean there are uh, I don't think we can be egalitarians when it comes to different beliefs. Some beliefs are so absurd that they really are worthy of ridicule. But all beliefs are learned, and everyone has to learn in a certain process. So I'm very patient with the process of discovery and learning. We all have a journey of discovery. You can't know everything all at once. We have to learn in a certain sequence. Everyone's sequence is different than someone else's. Now, that being said, my patience with the learning curve is, uh, uh, I have to acknowledge on the one side. On the other side though, if you have a total disregard for evidence and reason, any rational thought or argumentation, that by itself means you're dismissed from consideration, in my view. There is no honest revolt against rational thought, against logic. If I say to you, the apple is and isn't at the same time and in the same respect, I'm not being honest with myself, much less with you. Contradictions do not exist. To admit a contradiction is to admit an error, <laughs> and I gotta go back to the drawing board. If you say I can live with this contradiction, then you're saying I could just live with, you know, there being a God or not a God at the same time. Whenever it's convenient for me to have a God, I believe in a God. Whenever it's convenient for me not to believe in God, I don't believe in God. You may as well just do unless that. The, unless it's fickle, like your emotions, and your, your God appears when right. certain emotions appear. But then again, that's a whole different... I feel what you mean. I feel what you mean. I get, I get it. No. Look, I, 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 I'm sub submitting to reality. The facts of reality got to come first. A honest approach to science says observation first, facts first, explanations come from that, not the other way around. When someone says, I've got my theory that I believe and everything else has got to be rationalized to explain that, that's dishonest on its face. That's just not an honest mental approach. We might not even recognize that we're doing that sometimes. We might not even do recognize, but if someone is an overt mystic, if someone explicitly says, well, I reject your logic, Mr. Valiant. I reject going by the facts. I reject listening to logic. There's no communicating with them. There's no persuasion you can do. There is nothing. They are incapable of being reached. Mm. Are they you saying they're in outer darkness? I, they have they have blasphemed the Holy Spirit? They shut their mind off from <laughs> learning. Yeah. They're, I, I they're, I'm saying I cast them out into the darkness of not not considering what they're saying at all. <laughs> you may as well be in a madhouse and consider right. the the assertions of a lunatic. Um, as I mean, far that, as that's, that's once some you, strong words. Once you've stepped away, but once you've stepped away from reason and reality, by what do I measure sanity? By what do I measure error or accuracy? Mm. Once I've lost that, anything goes. You could believe in you know fairies. You could believe in Tolkien's magical, you know, whatever w crap you want to believe, you can get away with believing. Anything goes yeah. once you step down of reason and reality. And there is no honest, in my mind, an honest mental revolt against reason. When someone says, no, I am irrational on purpose, or this is outside of reason, 
then they have just thereby stepped outside of any serious consideration by me. Okay, you may I got well. to give a plug to my boy, John. Thank you for the 20 super chat, bro. Appreciate yeah. it, man. Hey, I go see Dr. Bob tomorrow, guys. Um, with Dragons and Genesis, Jason, folks, his YouTube channel. You make sure you subscribe. Of course, I'm going to plug all that stuff in the videos. And you'll get early access to all of that stuff in the Patreon because that's what I do. Uh, you know, I can't launch everything at once, but there's like hundreds of videos on the Patreon if you're not part of it. Hit that like button while you're here, too. Uh, I really do appreciate the likes. It helps the channel continuously grow. And we were all over the place today, James. We we touched on a, a ton of stuff. We got into Michael Shermer's The the Believing Brain, which you are really – you love talking about this. And, and I love what you said. Observable, testable, knowable things before going out. Don't start with something like our good friend uh, Jeff Briggs starts with consciousness – and then wants to go into, well, uh, the, the all matter and everything we could test and know and whatnot. Um, also, we talked about Bart Ehrman. We got into the New Testament. We delved into that. We talked about John J. Collins. I'm currently reading this book. And when I get off of here, I'm going to continue reading it, try and finish this, get some good questions up for him. Uh, there's a bunch coming. There's a bunch coming. Uh, You've got such cool stuff coming. I mean, if there are people listening here who aren't, subscribed and liking and actually even joining patreon for you they're got to have their heads looked at you've got the most valuable religion podcast out there every time i learn something every time you stimulate my mind and if you're doing that for me i got to imagine there's a lot of other people out there you're doing that for so i appreciate it brother yeah dude you came last minute i really appreciate you jumping on dr joshua bowen was going to jump on and just give us some comments and stuff as well he was going to talk about these scholars because i know that he admires dr collins he admires dr airman and i don't know if he knows much about uh, dr Shermer or not but i know well, that we're doing admirable work whatever other we may not all agree about everything all the time and i know all of them these guys would probably have strong disagreements with me about stuff but the point is i learn from each of the guys you mentioned and uh uh i probably you know if we can't do that if we can't learn from people we even disagree with uh then again it's our our problem our minds are closed off to the truth we have to stay open you've taught me so much man honestly james i and in the way that you present and communicate, we can all tell that you're a lawyer. So if you need help in court, no, I'm just <laughs> I don't do that anymore. <laughs> I know, but damn it, I had to say something, you know. <laughs> Mitch uh, Mazzaroli, thank you so much, man. Appreciate the 20. Uh, thanks a lot. It means a lot. Everyone who's helped support what we do. And let's keep growing this community. Let's continuously yeah. make this happen. And there's a Discord. If you guys like the chat room, go in there. You guys can uh, talk about ideas, leave a comment. You know, hit me up on Facebook. I got the Facebook page. Uh, hit up, hit up our friend here. You know what I mean? Get his book, Creating Christ. I mean, I'm active on Facebook. You can ask me questions. I'm, a, I usually am there to talk and debate and discuss, answer any questions people have about this stuff. And he's more than willing to engage obviously if you guys are able to present uh you know be kind in your conversation he's willing to engage and uh have those and hopefully just saying this like i'm gonna speak it into existence i'm just kidding um <laughs> let it be <laughs> i know right i want to get you and dr carrier to discuss or have a debate if if that's what he's willing to do on the topic of your book i would be honored i'd be honored i, I as i say i follow his work very closely on ancient science. And I think it's important work that he's doing in m more than one way. Um, so it would be my honor and privilege. Discord is in the description of this video. If you want to join that, you go click the discord link. If you have a discord, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much before you exit off of here, hit that like button. Like I said, I always remind people that cause we just sometimes forget and it helps us. So James, you rock, and everyone who showed up, and patrons, and uh, and the super chats, guys, you guys freaking rock! I didn't even like plan this live. I just went, man, I gotta just talk. I just gotta mention some stuff. I'm excited about the books I'm reading and the material that's coming across my uh, my my thinking right now. And you were the first guy, um, and a couple guys actually wrote and said, "Look, you know what I mean?" Excuse me, yeah. So I appreciate it, bro. No, you'd like to say anything to everybody? Oh, 
<laughs> what, what what left is there to say? <laughs> no, you rock, my brother. You I would need more say. caffeine to be able to go into any more, to be honest. <laughs> <Right. with you. laughs> so I love you guys. And if you have cognitive dissonance, okay, and you just, I don't know, you just can't figure it out, remember this. We are MythVision. Thanks,